So colleagues, 18 months ago, this is a little bit of history, uh, a group of uh, Columbia University faculty um, from three campuses, this is downtown, the main campus, the medical campus, and Le Mans campus, uh, and eight discipline areas came together to figure out how we, we could do better to detect, to prevent, and to respond to natural, accidental, and deliberate catastrophic events, uh, and by mobilizing, in our view, the most advanced knowledge and expertise we have from all the appropriately relevant disciplines at our disposal. Uh, at, the, at, at uh, Columbia University. Today, what we'd like to do is share with you three projects. Uh, and these projects are at various stages of development that have grown out of this initiative for the educational value for students, which is why we made a very special effort to have students present, for debate and refinement, because only through those means do we um, have more sophisticated approaches to what is a global response. The global health security agenda is a global response, and therefore quite an ambitious response to uh, sniff out um, risk uh, and to respond to that risk uh, in a way that we are capable of doing when we have been able to almost master all manner of things in terms of what it is the Earth has to offer. So we ask, must always ask the question, can we do better? And we certainly can do better. And if you, if you model what happened with the Spanish flu outbreak after the First World War and imposes on today's environment, we clearly are not in a position to actually deal with the consequences of that as a catastrophe. Um, and so it's important for us to continuously work at a much better response uh, given the knowledge base that we've accumulated, which is quite considerable. So, the three projects we are going to talk about today, oh, and let me say, it's for debate and refinement and to establish a much more durable network of experts to contribute to policy formulation globally. The projects are, uh, the first one uh, deals with nurses and pandemics, which is funded by the Center for the Study of Social Difference, uh, Stroke Women Creating Change. The second one deals with advancing biosecurity and this in partnership with the Nuclear Threat Initiative with the Biological Division. And the third um, uh, project deals with what we call the Children Hospital in Africa Mapping Project, or CHAMP, uh, which is funded by the Elmo Philanthropy and by somebody called Charles Hamilton. We will record this entire symposium and we will use the materials to raise awareness and to communicate about these compelling questions that require intervention. We will develop a white paper on children and emergencies. We will launch a Columbia chapter of the next generation of young professionals in global health security. So thank you again for coming. And if I may introduce you then to the speakers for the first session that deals, the opening session that deals with nurses and uh, catastrophe. And uh, let me just introduce the speakers and then um, call on them one by one uh, to come forward. Uh, the first is Jennifer Dawn, who is an associate professor and director of global initiatives at the School of Nursing and of the PAHOP WHO Collaborating Center for Advanced Nursing Practice. The second speaker um, is Kathleen uh, Pike. And Kathleen, um, is a professor of psychology in the departments of psychiatry and epidemiology and the director of the Global Mental Health Program at the Columbia University Irving Medical Center. Uh, Kathleen is also a director of the WHO Collaborating Center, and I'm sure I'm getting the title wrong, but it deals with mental health. Um, and the third speaker that we have um, is um, Yanis Ben Amour, who is... Um, Assistant Professor of Global Health and Microbiological Sciences at the Columbia University Medical Center and the Executive Director uh, of the Center for Sustainable Development at the Earth Institute uh, on the main campus and Le Mans campus 
uh, and elsewhere uh, at Columbia University. Our discussionist is Elaine Larson, who introduced uh, today's events. And Elaine is the Anna C. Maxwell Professor of Nursing Research at the School of Nursing and Professor of Ep Epidemiology at the Maimon School of Public Health, Columbia University Irving Medical Center. So if I may call on Jennifer. Thanks. So good morning. I'm speaking to you today about On the Front Lines, Nursing Leadership in Pandemics, and I'm speaking to you as um, a midwife and as a nurse practitioner about my colleagues, and I have um, borne witness to them uh, throughout the HIV um, pandemic, which continues in sub-Saharan African countries, and uh, feel verily, uh, want you to hear their stories and what we are doing in nursing, because I think we will see very clearly that one of the doors to open resolution of how we respond to pandemics is going to be about calling on our profession to have a larger role. So you will hear often today uh, the magnitude of the problem that we are discussing, the rapid rise of emerging and re-emerging pathogen outbreaks. Um, I'm only mentioning a few uh, thank you, Elaine, for referring to the cholera outbreak uh, in Yemen. Um, HIV, uh, which has claimed 37 million deaths, 37 million deaths. Women, men, children, babies uh, have died and continue to be infected um, by this pathogen. Uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome, first identified in 2002. Um, <clears throat> Middle East respiratory syndrome, first identified in 2012. Ebola virus disease, which we are going to discuss more at length, uh, Zika. Uh, the number of outbreaks per year has tripled in the last several de decades. So we're not seeing uh, something that we're containing. We're seeing something that is emerging and re-emerging. And uh, certainly globalization, which has many advantages and strengths, um, also increases the potential for outbreaks, um, pandemics, uh, and I always um, talk to my students when we look at uh, global health equity and the responsibility of the nursing profession uh, that the Ebola virus did not know it could board a plane. So we face a very uh, serious situation. Uh, the World Health Organization in its emergency preparedness and response document has its vision of developing an integrated global alert and response system for epidemics and other public health emergencies based on strong national public health systems and capacity and effective international system for coordinated response. So that is a shared vision of all of us and what we're doing is what does that mean uh, down to the level of the community. And the global health security agenda, which Wilmot referred to and we're going to hear more about also today, which was launched in February 2014, a growing partnership of over 64 nations looks at preventing how do we prevent? How do we detect early uh, so there can be a, a rapid response and an effective response? So I would pose to you today, uh, what health cadre is central to this response? Who are we going to look at uh, in the healthcare team that needs more voice and strengthening? And I would say to you uh, that certainly is nurses and midwives. Uh, we are the largest cadre of health workers. In some countries, 90% um, of health workers are nurses and midwives. And if anyone uh, sees someone during their life in many countries, it will be a nurse at a clinic level. So to have a, a vibrant, vigorous um, nursing midwifery profession that can respond effectively uh, to general public health needs as well as to emergency catastrophes, uh, we need certainly to focus on how we strengthen this through education, um, effective planning and leadership building, strong regulation for our scope of practice, and uh, looking at how we uh, invest and increase um, our profession. Focusing in a little bit more on some stories of uh, nurses and midwives in response to um, pandemics, um, I'm looking here at uh, a sister, uh, Primrose Naklima, who is in Eastern Cape Province, and I uh, used to go um, village to village with her, uh, and she would go to each door and say to women, you're pregnant, you need to come and be tested 
for the HIV virus. And it turns out it was actually more important to know if you were positive than when your baby was due because of the rates of transmission from mother to baby. So being able to say to women, at this point there was no treatment in South Africa. It was an age of denialism. This was 2002, 2003, 2004. Um, and this was a, a death sentence, in fact, for women. But her message was, we still have to come in and make you as healthy as we can and make your baby as healthy as we can. So breaking through stigma, going to the front line. And in fact, over the next eight years, up to 2010, we see nurses and midwives really taking charge of educating the community uh, and being able to advance their practice around HIV management, which led in 2010 to South African legislation for nurse-initiated and managed ART care. A great victory uh, that our profession could be recognized and had the ability to actually treat uh, at the clinic level. So we play many, many roles uh, with our profession. We're certainly the provider, um, as Sister Noxima is, of giving direct care, or the educator for that woman, family in front of us, uh, and also for the community in terms of breaking through myths, stigma, explaining how transmission happens, empowering people that there's something they can do, which becomes our role as protector and advocate, a gatherer of data, contact tracing, so we are the people on the front line who are able to say who started and who knows who and whose family is connected where, uh, the researcher, um, gathering the information, looking at best practices and response, what should be implemented, and a leader in voice and policy. So why the Ebola outbreak in 2014? Well, this is almost like the perfect storm, uh, where you look at it having, Ebola having first been diagnosed in 1976, but historically it was in rural areas and could be contained fairly quickly. What happened in 2014 in Guinea, uh, Liberia, and Sierra Leone with, with the first infection of a two-year-old toddler named Emil who was playing with fruit on the ground that had um, bat droppings on it and was the first identified case of Ebola virus disease uh, is that you have uh, three countries uh, with very fragile healthcare systems, borders not defined by ethnic communities, so people migrated back and forth. You have large urban cities, so great flux between cities and rural areas, and you have um, burial practices. Uh, life is short. Um, burying is something that you give respect to your, your elders or your young people. So burial practices that could involve up to a week of being with the body, touching, feeding, washing, kissing the body, which turns out was exactly a, a major form of transmission. So at the end of three years, we have um, <clears throat> a total of 11,300 deaths, 28,500 children, uh, infections, excuse me, and a lingering effect, which is rarely looked at these days, of there's more than 23,000 children, 23,000 children who lost one or both parents during this outbreak. What's going to happen to them? Uh, 1,260 children who survived Ebola but have additional medical problems as well as facing stigma, and a really he heavy toll on healthcare workers with the nurses and midwives having the highest uh, fatality rates in providing care during this epidemic. So, uh, sorry, Josephine Finde-Selo, anyone who's been in my class will know her name and uh, remember her. So she's a head uh, deputy nurse matron at a government hospital in Sierra Leone. And at the time that this picture, her picture on the left appeared in the New York Times, uh, she was, um, her unit of 24 nurses, uh, 15 had died in one month, and there she was. Um, I worried about her for years, and did she survive? And in fact, with internet, found her recently, and she said, even before this Ebola situation, I had given my life to this job and to keep my people healthy. If I'm not here to do this job, who else will? So she stayed. Family begged her to leave, leave work, leave the country, and she stayed because she felt it was her responsibility to um, educate the community in safe practices on burial, explain transmission, provide direct care, and certainly uh, look at how um, the virus and the outbreak could be contained. These are often unsung heroes. And here's a nurse with Nubia Suma, 
who was the first baby born known to survive, a mother di who died from Ebola infection, and um, look at her as a sign of hope, of what is the future. So these same nurses that were on the front line during this Ebola viral uh, outbreak are also now trying to rebuild their communities. Um, with the health, fragile health care systems, they were devastated. So how do we bring back, how do we lower rates of maternal mortality? Um, how do we rebuild uh, trust in the health care system that was greatly challenged? Um, so these voices of um, nurses and midwives on the front line need to be heard. They both um, express stories of resilience and hope, but they also contain best practices and evidence of how we could respond differently. And that's what I really want us to focus on in our discussion of how can we do this differently, how can we call upon these wise women's stories and lessons, and in fact build stronger ways of response. So this was kind of haunting when I saw this uh, from a nurse uh, who said, being a nurse is like being a soldier. You cannot take your uniform off when there is battle. And this was said actually in 2015, and yet it's really true today in the DRC where there are new outbreaks and there is war. So there's a, a, a paralysis in terms of giving vaccinations uh, and uh, how to respond when you have the situation of war. The American Academy of Nursing uh, issued a policy recommendation uh, this past May on expanding nurses' role in responding to global pandemics and cited four things, uh, building in-country um, community health worker to clinic nurse to physician lab technician uh, network. How do we build that in a way that can go immediately into effect? Um, how do we collaborate with identified country nurse leaders who've developed a national grounds up nurse coordinated network? How, how are we identifying them and making this network vibrant and, and effective? Um, looking at a curriculum for community health workers and nurses regarding identification and reporting of infectious disease, very critical. And looking at how do we have a better strategic plan for distribution of resources? How do we look in countries at going to community and decentralizing a response as opposed to centralizing and therefore not reaching the majority of people infected? So I am part of a new um, uh, working group uh, project um, called On the Front Lines, Nursing Le Leadership in Pandemics, Tem Pandemics which uh, Victoria Rosner is here, and Wilmot, and myself, in a working group, a very uh, rigorous working group from Columbia Global Centers in Nairobi, uh, Center of Oral uh, History Research, Mailman School of Public Health, School of Journalism. And what we are trying to do, we have three goals in this project. The first is to document nurses and midwives' experiences fighting Ebola. So we are looking specifically at this um, pandemic uh, and have the honor of working with uh, the Center for Oral History Research, which is guiding us in developing a template for how we will conduct interviews of nurses and midwives in the three countries. And we have already built a network uh, with guidance of who we can contact and who we will interview. Uh, the second is uh, developing policies to combat future outbreaks and looking at how do we strengthen the global health security agenda uh, and be able to say out of these uh, analysis of these stories will in fact come key lessons of what uh, the effective response means. And the third goal being uh, we will have an international conference in the spring of 2020 uh, that will involve a representation from the nurses and midwives themselves who are leading this. And uh, we have a wonderful alum, Laura Ridge, who's built a Nursing for All, which works in Liberia. Uh, we have a nurse practitioner here, Florence Dowry, at Columbia Presbyterian, who's a leader among nurse, nurses in uh, Sierra Leone. Uh, we have a really strong response of people wanting to come forward and help. And so I would close by saying that uh, there is a real intersection and that over 70% of the nursing and midwifery profession are women. So there's an intersection here with medical hierarchy, our profession being mostly women, uh, and 
uh, how, does, how do we change this? How do we make our healthcare team stronger so that we do not miss opportunities? How do we have a different say about what we do going forward to have a response that will save lives and create a much safer world? Thank you. So I'm going to focus on two uh, contexts as a specific case in points, uh, cases in point around what we know about healthcare workers and mental health considerations for healthcare workers in terms of the Ebola virus disease in West Africa, and then uh, the Japan um, crisis, the uh, trifecta of the um, tsunami, earthquake, nuclear disaster, and the health, mental health consequences associated with the healthcare workforce in that context. Two very different kinds of disasters and uh, two very different systems in place in advance of the disaster, but some very similar issues in terms of mental health issues for those who are on the front line. So, uh, as has already been referenced in terms of Ebola in West Africa, the three countries most significantly hit uh, were Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea. And uh, what I'd like to do is uh, acknowledge that there was enormous devastation for the entire population. Uh, we often forget that the healthcare workers are part of that population, right? So, we have... Uh, Almost half of the uh, health workers' deaths were in Sierra Leone. Uh, more than 50% of all health worker infections were nurses. And many of those infections happened outside the treatment units because of poor infection prevention and control. And, uh, and in the context of very limited resources, uh, as Jennifer said, the nurses felt an enormous commitment to persevering despite the really compromised conditions and lack of supplies and infrastructure. So it raises a question of what we're doing with our healthcare workforce, putting them in contexts where we know the risks are dramatically increased for their own, uh, their own health. And so I was uh, part of work with the IRC, the International Rescue Committee, that did a qualitative and um, lightly quantitative study looking at the mental health burden for these healthcare workers. And there are three really important uh, points that I'd like to highlight. One is that the healthcare workers talked uh, significantly about the experience of loneliness and distancing from their communities. This in part was by design. They knew that they were at increased risk and distanced themselves, but um, was in enormous cost and had significant mental health costs in terms of experience of loneliness and stigma. So one of the quotes related to loneliness and distancing Children used to come here and hug us. Now they run away from us. They call us the devil. There was tremendous stigma and isolation that had mental health implications. Uh, it was too much. Firstly, people were cursing us that we have received money. So that was a very complicated issue that created guilt, that created additional burden uh, for the healthcare workers. Uh, people are said to be dying because we want blood. Rumors spread that we, that we were selling bodies. The humiliation was too much on us. They tell us not to get closer to them. It was not easy anyway, but we still endured. And the um, idea that at the same time uh, that the healthcare workers saw that the, they needed to follow the IPC measures in terms of uh, prevention, preventing infectious uh, uh, dispersion of the, the virus, um, they, it was seen as very divisive um, because screening booths and protective equipment inhibited bonding or suffering with patients. So it created an othering 
of the healthcare workers. The, um, the mental health needs that grow out of that situation of distress, um, in addition to the emotional needs, one of the um, other aspects of the, that increased the mental health burden was the experience that we know broadly applies. It's not unique to the Ebola crisis, but additional sources of stress that the healthcare workers described were increased time pressure, uh, deadlines, poor working conditions, uh, excessive workload prolo and prolonged working hours, and the conflict between different beliefs uh, in terms of interpersonal relationships and maladministration. So believing that the, they were not being supported in terms of the, the workplace requirements, uh, leading to significantly increased experiences of demotivation, uh, anxiety, depression, and, and ultimately impacting the health care that they were able to deliver. They also described enormous fears, right? Living as, Jennifer said, as soldiers on the front lines and fearing for their own lives every day, uh, which resulted in what they described as a weakened sense of trust. Uh, again, a significant, that lack of trust has significant mental health implications. Uh, the stigmatization of their practice feeling both that they were following required medical procedures, but that they ran, it, that they frequently were in conflict with local customs. Uh, emotional isolation. So there were healthcare workers describing the experience of not being able to go home when we know that family and peers uh, and that kind of emotional support is very important in terms of mental health protection. And so, a general sadness with some minority of individuals actually developing clinical depression. Uh, one quote here from a uh, healthcare worker in the Western area, we lost our colleague here, and I was the person that stayed with that colleague for the rest of the day. When I went home, they called me, they texted me that she's gone, she's dead. Three days or four days after the result was out, saying she was positive, Ebola positive. I started thinking about myself, the time that I was taking care of Nurse X. Did I dress properly? How did I dress? So I was confused. My mind was scattered. After days, I became sick. The mind was sick. Everything about me was sick. So there was an enormous compromise in terms of the healthcare workers' capacity to deliver the care that they believe they should be delivering because of the emotional mental health burden. And I, I want to go back and underscore the, the reality that the frontline workers, we think of them and identify them as healthcare workers, but they are members of the community as well. And that membership gets very complicated. The factors that seem to protect in terms of mental health were the sense of duty, that this is, uh, this is what I do as a healthcare worker, as a nurse, uh, family and peers, the social interpersonal factors that we know are very important in terms of mental health support. Uh, social media actually was, a, was something that many of the healthcare workers identified as being important to their staying connected to each other and building a network within their group uh, and religious beliefs and supports. So one of the things that we did uh, at the IRC was to try to understand better with the healthcare workers uh, what we could do to reduce the fear, reduce the associated depression and anxiety uh, th so that they could perform their job better. And um, so it was both around the tactical strategies of delivering services and around the emotional uh, mental health 
uh, considerations of reducing fear and enabling them to uh, develop practices and policies that would work better. So we did a participatory analysis with the healthcare workers, a health committee, and IRC staff about what are the issues, what could we do, where are the points of conflict with the community, with their own um, availability of resources, and what would the um, proposals look like going forward. The thing that was empowering about this, of course, is that it is in line with um, being built by the users so that ultimately the systems that were designed uh, worked because they, they fit the needs of the, the community immediately and actually uh, were associated with significant improvements in terms of various uh, baseline and follow-up. Mm, you can't see the uh, X axis, but the yellow is before the baseline and the white is after following the new um, practices in terms of uh, IPC practices, new practices for IPC and new practices for social support. So in terms of um, asking patients to wash hands, for example, is the second bar. You can see a significant increase. You can see a significant increase in the two tall bars there in terms of um, following correct orders and um, co distancing oneself in terms of contact uh, and sitting sideways to patients following the procedures. So strategies that the healthcare workers had identified as ways of preventing the transfer of the, uh, the virus and removing uh, clothing once um, they had visited with someone who was uh, Ebola virus positive. So there were some, some modest but significant changes in behavior. What's interesting to me about this is that the changes in behavior, as I said, were not so great, but by conducting this workshop, by engaging healthcare workers in the, pra in the practice of defining new procedures, the mental health experiences improved. So there's an, an experience of agency and control and understanding that had significant impact on reducing anxiety, fears, and associated mental health consequences. The, um, another program that we were involved with in Liberia was a program called Care for Caregivers. And uh, this, again, was a program that was designed with the caregivers uh, as active participants in developing the program. And the focus there was on chronic stress and unaddressed anger. There's an enormous amount of anger that the healthcare workers felt towards the lack of resources, towards the confusing messages that they were always getting, towards the lack of support from the larger community. And so uh, the, they designed and prioritized a sa staff support group model to both, again, focus on the professional skills of providing better care, uh, and, um, but also identifying that they need and deserve the right to high quality care as healthcare workers. And for the first time, being able to say that out loud. In terms of uh, Japan and the Tohoku disaster, a very different kind of um, emergency. This was March 11th, 2011. Um, it was a natural and man-made disaster, 9.0 magnitude earthquake, 20,000 deaths, and this nuclear um, exposure that had major anxiety around healthcare um, risk. The intervention there was an arts intervention of en engaging the arts to um, conduct theater uh, with communities that were at risk. And we partnered with local Japanese theater companies and a group called Outside the Wire. And the um, thing that I want to highlight here is that there's this mental health paradox that even in a high-income country that has major resources, there is within the healthcare provider groups a high recognition of needs for mental health concerns 
and a high recognition that there are benefits, potential benefits to the healthcare workers, but an enormously high degree of discomfort in terms of seeking care. So despite high need, there's very low treatment seeking. So one of the things for us to think about as a community is how do we integrate the mental health needs? We know they're high. We know that the healthcare workers acknowledge that they're high, that there would be potential benefit, um, but they're not going to seek care uh, independently. So how do we weave that into the uh, supports that are, that are built in to supporting the healthcare workers? Again, issues around anxiety, fear, the survivor guilt that, that lingers, um, an enormous amount of shame, and a correlation between perceived lack of system support and mental health needs. So in summary, I think the, the mental health needs of the healthcare workers need to be integrated into the training, need to be validated to reduce stress and burnout. They're going to stay on the front lines. They are our soldiers in these healthcare disasters. Um, we need to think about uh, the strategies that are both around professional skills and delivery of care um, to increase confidence, um, but also support uh, social supports to promote coping, uh, bring mental health into the language around the needs of the healthcare users, to reduce the shame, burden, and stigma, and, um, and thereby increase appropriate treatment seeking and getting the appropriate supports to be successful. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, uh, Kathleen, for that um, masterful, masterful walkthrough, um, an area of uh, health that is increasingly being recognized as fundamentally important, both in terms of routine matters, but also in terms of emergencies. We know that we are better able to recognize mental health as a, as a component of uh, the global health burden, but there's also an increased um, uh, component of that that has uh, grown in the course of time, that the recognition has not been translated into appropriate interventions, uh, and therefore um, it's really, really quite fundamentally important for us to uh, think about uh, mental health, not as an afterthought, but as a key part of what the health burden is. If that's the case, even more so when it comes to catastrophes and dealing with emergencies, and we, where we all rely, as we do in times of war, we rely on soldiers. <laughs> uh, in times of, of, uh, of uh, catastrophes, we also rely fundamentally on frontline workers to be mentally capable of dealing with the trauma that they, that they face. And clearly what's required is to recognize it uh, and therefore, and then create support systems to make sure that they, in fact, protect us in the way that we expect them to do. So thank you very much, Kathleen, for that. If I now can turn to Yanis um, Benamor. Good morning, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to be speaking here today. Uh, I am not a nurse by training. I am a molecular biologist, um, but part of my work is to help validate new technologies that will help um, assisting the day-to-day -day activities of nurses and community health workers, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa and in rural India. And as you can see, the front photo <laughs> mirrors Jennifer's presentation, and that's uh, not the only thing that will mirror her presentation. So today, I want to, uh, in the next 15 minutes, uh, try to show you how new technologies and technologies uh, can assist during health catastrophes. And to do that, I will also talk about the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. So a lot of this has already been uh, addressed by Jennifer, but just to put it back into context, uh, at the end of the epidemic, there were over 28,000 cases that were reported that ultimately led to over 11,000 deaths. The three countries that were uh, affected mostly were Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. And uh, as Jennifer said, uh, all of the cases except baby Emile uh, were due to human-to-human uh, -human transmission. And that was worsened by an inability to seek care when ill and a failure to follow safe burial practices. So I'm not gonna go into details because some of this has already been addressed by Jennifer, but basically uh, when Ebola hit those three countries, already very weak health systems were in most cases completely destroyed. And the outcome was not just directly 
because of Ebola. The outcome was also indirectly on other diseases, and that's some of the things that maybe people don't necessarily think about is the hidden impact on healthcare because um, there was a mistrust or a distrust in accessing healthcare, uh, as was uh, also talked about by Kathy. People were afraid to go to the health centers uh, because of a fear of basically getting Ebola. Uh, so it was reported that maybe over 10,000 additional deaths were due to untreated conditions in Guinea, uh, over 1,000 unnecessary deaths due to HIV, over 2,000 unnecessary deaths due to tuberculosis because people basically stopped their treatment, and over 6,000 cases uh, due to malaria. So we already know that technology can assist the day-to-day -day activity of nurses and basically help them feel less isolated. Um, for instance, it connects them to their health supervisor uh, with improved communication, uh, access to training, online training. It connects them to the community uh, with the possibility of data collection, uh, vital events tracking, but also health education. And it also connects them to uh, basically this opportunity to collect data, uh, data reporting on a day-to-day -day basis and alerts and reminders that will help them to know what to do in a particular uh, circumstance. So let's look at the situation of the Ebola outbreak and how the health system should have been uh, functioning. So let's see if the pointer works. So, Typically, when a patient is confirmed with Ebola virus disease, the first step would be to send in a contact tracer to interview that patient and find out who are all of the people that this uh, patient, confirmed patient has interacted with. And we are now going to be following these Ebola virus suspects over 21 days because that is the, uh, how long it takes for the disease to, to manifest. And as soon as there is a symptom that appears, either fever or bleeding, then that suspect will be referred uh, by the contact tracer to an Ebola treatment center where, if all goes well, a sample will be taken uh, uh, to the lab, diagnosis will be made available. And then from there, either the patient is uh, Ebola negative or if he is Ebola positive, then um, he will be referred back to the Ebola treatment center where there are two outcomes, uh, either the treatment is successful and it leads to uh, survival, or the treatment is not successful and then uh, a special team will assist with safe burial. So today I will show you two ways where technology has or could have uh, assisted in the case of the Ebola outbreak. And that will be during the contact tracing, sorry, too much coffee. So during contact tracing, sorry, um, during contact tracing and also uh, diagnosis. So let's start with contact tracing. So typically, in a context where you don't have access to technologies, contact tracing and data reporting will happen manually, uh, paper-based. And so some of the issues that are associated with that, paper-based contact tracing creates delays between data collection and data consumption. It impedes rapid response and decision-making around contact tracing strategy. You may not necessarily know who are the people that you have not been following up on a day-to-day -day basis. There's a human error that is associated with data entry, misunderstanding of data, communication gaps, so that leads to lack of reliable, up-to-date, and consistent data on number of contact tracers, number of daily visits against number of expected visits, and then efforts on data cleaning, data entry, data compilation, which is very time intensive. And it takes away uh, from the time and resources needed for data analysis and troubleshooting. So I will show you the work that my team at the Earth Institute has done during the Ebola outbreak in 2015, where we worked with a platform called ComCare. So ComCare has been used for several mHealth-related activities, uh, data collection, creating checklists, program monitoring, client records, client counseling. So in our case, we actually developed an entire program geared for community health workers to go house to house and do these contact tracing. So anytime an Ebola patient was confirmed positive, um, one of our contact tracers that was specifically hired by Columbia University to go house to house would do the following. First, it would start off with registration. 
Who is the patient? Where do they live? We would need an address and we would need a phone number. And then for this 21 day incubation period, there is everyday visits and a special form was created asking about the symptoms. So as you can see, this is in French. We were working in Guinea at the time. So asking whether there are headaches, uh, nausea, loss of appetite, or any type of pain. So that happens over 21 days. And then the last one is the closure of the program, which had three outcomes. Either the program for this ticket for this particular patient was closed because the, pa the patient passed, or after 21 days, there were no symptoms, so they were exited out of the program, uh, or they had already uh, shown symptoms, and then they were transferred to one of the Ebola uh, treatment centers. The advantage of using mobile health in this particular case is that it had the added value of having GPS tracking, which was really important for two reasons. Number one, if you're trusting contact tracers to go to the house day to day, you want to make sure that they actually do go to the house day to day, or not just stay in their own house and filling out all of the forms as if they had seen the patient. So that we were able to track based on the GPS location of the contact tracer. Uh, and the other thing is, where are these contacts? You know, are they all clustered in the same area? Where are they located in a city? Uh, are, where are they located in a village? And that ended up being very useful. The other important thing is on a smartphone, all of the protocols came preloaded. So if one of the symptoms was ticked by one of the uh, contact tracer, automatically there was an alert to guide the contact tracer on what to do next. And then finally, uh, you could also organize your cases uh, by households or, or by village. So here I'm very quickly going to show you one of the dashboards uh, that was developed for us. Um, and for registration, for instance, this was very interesting because on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, you were able to see where your cases were located, how you were doing over time with the registration. You knew everything about your contacts, uh, whether they were male, female, how they connected to uh, the actual case of Ebola, uh, their age group, etc. Um, it was also very interesting to know how the visits uh, took place. So for instance, how there was some kind of an evolution over time, which obviously mirrored uh, the epidemic. Every day you knew exactly of all of the visits, how many of those who did not have a fever, did not have a symptom, of those who had a fever, those who uh, had symptoms, and then what happened to them. And again, there was this ability to do the visit uh, from a GPS perspective. So. Unlike what Jennifer said, and I guess this could be a point of discussion, for us, the contact tracer was not a nurse. Um, we actually believed that this was, it was very important to keep the nurses where they were supposed to be at the health center. And so that's why we hired the, a new cadre and we felt that this was uh, the job of the community health worker. But that is one example uh, of how technology has helped. The technology was actually available. It was developed during the outbreak and it helped turn the tide. Now I'm going to give you an example of how the technology could have helped, but it didn't come fast enough. And that's in the case of diagnosis. Um, so the ideal diagnostic test, and this is up for debate, I guess, is this rapid laminar flow. As long as the sensitivity and the specificity are good, this is what we are all aiming for. Basically, drops of blood, a little bit of urine, a little bit of saliva, few drops of buffer, you wait for 10 minutes, and then it gives you a clear yes or no answer. And you can do this even at the household level. And it doesn't require a lot of training, and particularly it doesn't require to be a lab technician. So unfortunately, at the time of the Ebola outbreak, there was no rapid test. To this day, there still aren't any that are uh, on the market officially. But so the standard was, polymerized chain reaction and RT-PCR. So without going too much into details, um, this is a highly sophisticated molecular technology. It requires some training for the health workers to be able to do that, but most importantly, it also requires a specific type of infrastructure. You wouldn't be able to do this in a household level. It requires electricity, um, and like I said, it requires trained personnel. The other option for LASA, for instance, is what we call ELISA, enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. It's a little bit easier than PCR, but still requires trained personnel. Um, this is very easy to see. Uh, all of the blue dots would be positive. You can do many patients at the same time. But again, you wouldn't be able to do this at the household level. 
So incidentally, here is a list of all of the diseases for which there is no rapid diagnostic test. Most notably, notably tuberculosis still doesn't have an RDT. Uh, Lassa fever still relies on ELISA, and Ebola virus, actually now there are a few RDTs that are under consideration. So, as it often happens during a health emergency, funding is flooded into the pipelines. And so this is what we saw in 2014 and 2015, uh, where all of these pipelines for new diagnostics, new vaccines, and new drugs uh, started being uh, created. So here I'm just quickly showing you the pipeline that was uh, quite dense in 2015. And you can note that only three candidates at the time uh, were rapid diagnostic tests that would have been useful at the point of care. And here I'm just showing you uh, one of the tests that uh, my team and I did validate in Guinea. Uh, this is a very useful test that doesn't just do uh, Ebola, it also do, uh, it does other fevers uh, uh, like chikungunya, Lhasa, uh, Zika, Marburg, and Dengue. So with just one drop of blood, you would be able to uh, distinguish any of those uh, hemorrhagic fevers. So uh, I was asked to give uh, a few thoughts about training of nurses and healthcare workers for these new technologies. And I would say that there are really two possibilities. Uh, one, during the health emergency, which I would call reactive. Um, obviously, you do that <laughs> as the health emergency is, is unfolding. So the questions that you would have to ask is, what technology is already available? Is there one that's better that's under development that would be worth waiting for before you train the entire country? And then you have to retrain again a few months later. The next question is, which healthcare worker should be using which technology? Um, I think the technology should not change the scope of work of the healthcare worker. So you would not want to turn a nurse into a lab technician. Um, it shouldn't change the location of their work, so that was my comment to Jennifer. I don't think that contact tracing really is the job of nurses, but I'm up for, for discussion on that. Um, and it should simplify their work and not be labor intensive. A lot of times, um, people on this side of the world develop amazing technologies, not thinking on you know, what impact it has on the day-to-day -day, uh, activity and how it's actually disruptive rather than helpful. Logistics. So would you do your training by region inside the country? Would you do it by district, by health center? Obviously, you would not want to do that nationally. In the case of a health emergency, take all of your healthcare healthcare workers to the capital while they're supposed to be helping uh, in rural areas. The always difficult question about in incentives. Do you want to incentivize healthcare workers to do their job in the context of health emergencies? And then for me, doing the training at that moment, so in a reactive way, uh, is is almost like teaching somebody how to swim when they're already drowning. So I don't think that is the best and most appropriate way. So therefore, I'm thinking trainings should probably be thought about before or after the health emergency, and I would call that proactive. So the rationale is that the training can be properly organized without having to rush and thinking about logistics and taking people out of their day-to-day -day job. Um, it allows the health system to be immediately responsive at the next outbreak, possibly limiting unnecessary, unnecessary casualties. But then the question is about the maintenance. How often do you do that? Do you do it every year? Do you do it every five years? And then for how long? So for instance, there hasn't been another outbreak in Sierra Leone since the last one, right? So do you graduate out of the program after five years, after 10 years, or is it forever? Um, then there are several issues with the before and after, particularly the before. How would you select a country uh, to justify a training in a country that never had an Ebola outbreak? So would you say that a logic would be all the neighboring countries of a country that already had an outbreak? That may be a good way to start. The other thing is it's very difficult. It will be very difficult to find funding to justify a training in a context where Ebola has not happened. Imagine, it's already very difficult to fund health activities uh, that are currently happening. So discussing with the Ministry of Health to take away from HIV, TB, and malaria programs to talk about Ebola that may or may not happen in the future will be extremely complicated. But let me ask you this question. For those of you who are familiar with the, with the situation in Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia, if the outbreak was to hit again, do you think that even though they had the outbreak in 2014, 2015, and the health system was strengthened, do you think that they will be ready now to 
um, respond effectively. All right, in conclusions, new technologies are not always the solution. They're not the solution to every problem, particularly not in health emergencies. Um, I think that they are problem, context, and healthcare worker specific, so you have to be very careful where you roll them out and who you give them to. Uh, and really, what I want to emphasize on is that they have to be developed with the end user in mind. Um, that's why the conversation with nurses and, and community health worker is so important. Otherwise, you just do this top-down approach where you arrive somewhere and you tell them this is what you're going to do now without taking into account how disruptive the technology can be. So a key element will be their rational introduction. Thank you for your attention. Um, thank you very much to Yanis. You know, one re requires uh, an appropriate match between technologies that are appropriate to um, specific environments and to think very hard about what that means in terms of resource stressed uh, places in the world. Um, the march of technology continues um, and um, what is really important is, is for us to think quite hard about how it is that we can use technologies in an appropriate way in a, in a resource um, stressed uh, situation. So thank you very much for taking us through that, uh, Jana. So I invited everybody to seated at the table and I'm gonna turn to Elaine Larson uh, to comment and also to lead a discussion. So, um, and I just wanted to say that um, we are gonna close the session at 10 o'clock for coffee. So, um, so you have 25 minutes, so thank you very much. All right, it's time for you all to do a little bit of work, and I hope that we have some time uh, before we end. I wanna summarize and we'll have some discussion, but I want you to be thinking while we're talking about what it is that you, in your organization, whether you're a student and as a student, in the organizations that are represented here or in the groups with which you work and belong, what you can do about some of these issues yourself. <clears throat> because it seems to me that one of the overriding themes is we see the problem. We've had a few suggestions of small pilot kinds of things going on. How do we deploy this? And who's responsible for doing it? So I'd like to first just summarize each of the three <clears throat> presenters and talk about some of the main issues that we need to discuss. So first, Jennifer remind us that we have a shared vision that's been articulated by WHO for an integrated, rapid, effective response for global security issues, in particular infections, but other um, <coughs> major events <coughs> as well. She reminded us that the largest cadre of healthcare professionals are nurses and midwives, and um, then Giannis, of course, reminded us and, and that we also have community health workers, so I think we should talk in general about the healthcare workforce and who should be doing what in the uh, appropriate, appropriate way in the proper, pro, appropriate setting. And then Jennifer talked about the American Academy of Nursing Policy Statement that talks about what nurses should be doing globally in the context of pandemics, et cetera. Well, I want to tell you that I was one of the authors of that policy statement, and I always thought it was lame, <laughs> even though I helped write it, because it says what we should do. It doesn't say anything about how we're going to do it. Okay? So I think one of the things we need to talk about is we've got a fairly good description mm -hmm. of the problem. So now, it, what are we going to do about it? Okay, so Kathleen then uh, reminded us about the horrendous mental health challenges and issues from, for healthcare workers, and really um, talked about the ethical issue and the dilemma of putting the healthcare, knowing that putting the healthcare worker at risk in settings in which they don't have the resources to protect themselves <clears throat> or other patients um, in, against infections or other risks. They're not present, and yet they still 
are at risk, and we know it, and they know it. Okay. So dealing with this catch-22, again, we know it's there. Uh, how are we going to respond to it? And she gave us a couple of examples of interventions that had looked good. You know, uh, one was sort of helping prepare people, simply being explicit and acknowledging to the healthcare worker that, that you understand uh, the dilemma that they're going through and the mental health issues and the stigma versus, you know, uh, feeling like you need to do your job. And some of the interventions that showed promise, I think, was this idea of giving people control and agency, a sense of knowing what to do even if it's within a limited resource setting, focusing on professional care and being explicit about their needs. So again, how do we move that to another level? How do we deploy those small things? And then Giannis helped us out by talking about some of the terrific technology in mHealth that's available and actually probably not that expensive because most people have, well, many, many around the world have iPhones now and smartphones and all kinds of stuff. So he talked about how the mHealth can help the frontline staff, useful for alerts and reminders, keeping them connected, some of this issue of loneliness and stigma going on, Con contact tracing, um, rapid diagnosis, eventually communicating and troubleshooting. And he gave us an example of ComCare for contact tracing, which is terrific, just the beginning. So the issues that I want to ask you to talk about now is how do we deploy these things? How do we upscale any inter interventions, whether it's M Health, whether it's mental health support for the healthcare workers, whether it's providing community health workers and, and um, resources, et cetera, and how do we integrate these identified needs with seeking the, see the care seeking? This is one of the things that Kathleen. So uh, I want you now, in the context of why you're here, to talk about uh, these issues. And we have about 15 minutes. Yes. So, did you, okay, uh, thank you for your question. No, in this particular case, we actually hired the contact tracers and they were all literate. And that was, that was a, a condition for them to be able to know how to use the software. Um, there, are, there are tools out there that rely exclusively on images uh, so that you could actually use non-literate or very, liter very little literate uh, healthcare workers. But in our case, that was not the case. One of the advantages of the images, though, which we consider a lot with the global mental health work is that it translates across languages very quickly. So um, we find that if, it get, if you only have images, it's like getting those instructions, those assembly instructions that are I impossible because it's just not sufficient. <laughs> but if you have images with only a little bit of text, it makes the translation much more, um, much easier across countries. True, but I would say make sure that you have a focus group of people from the country where you're mm -hmm. going to make sure that that is the case. You know, red is not always the color that means stop. Green is not right. always the color that means go. One of the funny examples for me being from Switzerland is your emergency flag is our national flag, the red cross, <laughs> the, the white cross on the red background. So every time I go to a hospital, I see, oh, Switzerland. But in fact, emergency rooms everywhere in Europe is the opposite, right? It's the red cross on the white background. So it doesn't always translate. Right. Right. Well, the other thing is that if you're colorblind, you can't see green and red. <laughs> and my son is colorblind, and he can tell when he can go by the the intensity of the light, not by the color. Yeah. So I'm sorry about that. It's female 
trait, so I gave him the X, bad X chromosome. Could be worse. He's still a nice guy. <laughs> can I can I add something? You know, it just makes me think about um, HIV in the early days in the 2000s, and one of the big unfortunate arguments about um, dispersing antiretroviral treatment was that people would not know how to use it and then we would have more mutations. Luckily that argument was defeated by massive protests in the streets and in Durban and other parts of the country in South Africa. Um, what people did have is that everyone had a cell phone and it transformed the ability of nurses to reach patients and look for side effects. So there's, there's a history to be built on of adapting technology uh, that we should be grateful for and run with because anyone can learn to do this. It's, it's what do we do, and I thought you raised a great uh, issue, what do we do between outbreaks? How do we stay prepared and keep a workforce that's engaged in learning how to do this? Because it can be used for multiple other treatments while you're learning how to deal with apps that might be specific to something. I would say that WHO fell short during the 2014-2015 outbreak. Um, one of the consequences of that was the unacceptable territoriality, I would call, that happened in, for instance, in Guinea. So Colombia was a little slow, uh, for reasons I'm not going to go into, to intervene and to help and to send people. Um, when we arrived, the country had already been mapped. This is UNICEF country. This is Johns Hopkins country. <laughs> this is basically people were like, no, we are we are taking care of this area, and you know, Colombia is not welcome there. So we arrived with an uh, uh, an interesting idea, right? Which is that doing the contact tracing with M Health, nobody else had that anywhere else, but still it took a lot of resistance for, uh, and, and push for us and for my boss Jeffrey Sachs to actually make it happen. So. Had WHO taken a stronger lead into saying, okay, no, your expertise is in this field. This is going to be national. Your expertise is in this one. This is going to be national. Rather than cutting the country like Gruyère, which was unfortunate. There was actually an, a New York Times article to, to denounce that. And, and as a result, depending on where you were in the country, you didn't have access to the same interventions. I would like to add that one of the challenges that I think we have in this global work is the local global tension. And that at the same time that the Red Cross flag is the flag of Switzerland and there are really, really important local considerations in every single case, I think we're falling down on the global argument is cowering a little bit, and that we could do a much better job identifying five, ten common denominator factors that need to be flavored with the local experience. They need to be specific to the lo local context. But we know, for example, that clear, explicit professional procedures increase efficacy and trust. We know that mental health matters in every single context. We know certain things are universal. And I think we're falling down on, on effectively articulating those 
in ways that then can be utilized locally. And I think a, a roadmap that has these universal steps that then get operationalized locally would be very helpful. Just very quickly to add, I think. One quick comment about WHO. It's very popular to use WHO as a punching bag. They don't have power, per se. They don't, they're not well funded. They do the best that they can. Uh, everybody wanted to go in and test his or her vaccine, or his or her drug, or his or her contact tracing protocol. There were more, in some instances, there were more scientists and investigators than there were patients. So it is important to coordinate these efforts, I agree, but there were many people who were left out, if you will, because there were already too many people present. So the fact that Columbia wasn't well represented there on the auspices of the Earth Institute doesn't mean that there weren't people who were contributing elsewhere from Columbia who were not providing service and resources. So Ian, I think you have a good point that it's not necessarily WHO, but it's territoriality that we have a problem with in every area, I think. I mean, uh, Larry's saying no, so you can disagree, but certainly in nursing, for example, it's unclear who would be the coordinator or the decision mm -hmm. maker. So there's ANA and you know all other organizations, the academy, all of whom are making recommendations, but it's hard to know who needs to coordinate those things. So there is a lot of that, and I'd be interested in what Larry it, and- It is an issue, but furthermore, it's the province of the country to decide how it wants to approach the problem. You know, we have this very colonial approach. Is that you know, no, the, the, I don't disagree with you in terms of the territoriality. That wasn't the point. The point was around best practices. What the WHO does best, because you're right, there are no resources many things, they make things normative. You know, they say the expectation around pediatric vaccines is this series of vaccines, and every nation then strives to achieve that normative level of vaccination. We should be doing the same thing around emergencies. There should be acceptable strategies for whatever mental health approaches that they validate seal of approval from WHO. You can pepper it with the local flavor. I get that. But I swear, every time I watch this play out again, everybody's making it up. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. just ridiculous. We don't make up vaccine schedules. Mm -hmm. Anyway. <laughs> We have a comment in the front, and then uh, Phil and Rita. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I came in late. I'm actually from Syria, Leon. Um, prior to the Ebola outbreak, I was actually in Syria, Leon, uh, just before the initial outbreak. Before the initial outbreak in Kenema, I was giving uh, a talk. The thing about Sierra Leone is when you go there to give a talk or do a training or implement any program, usually they invite the hierarchy. They are not really the ones doing the work. And you coming in, you are uh, either if you are in, from America, you are a dollar. If you are in, from UK, you are a euro. So most of the people you are actually training, they're not actually implementing the whatever it is that you are. So, and those, the, the lower hierarchy, they kind of stand off. So it, it's very difficult. So when, when we were initially training them about Ebola, about hand washing, they said, oh, she's from America. She thinks she knows it all. So it, it's good to have somebody who can really have the community buy-in. And over time, um, they'll buy-in. I was there. During the Ebola, at one point we said, okay, they had a 311 call. When somebody gets sick, somebody calls 311 to the to the district office, then they will send somebody to come test this, per, uh, this person. So it's really very important. When you're doing it, go to the, uh, the local people. Not the health officials, I can tell you that, because I've worked with them from 2004 
2014. Thank you. I just want to say that this, uh, this is who I referred to when I was giving my remarks. This is Florence Dowry, who's a uh, nurse practitioner at New York Presbyterian and a leader in Sierra Leone. Related to that, it occurs to me in terms of making it up, Larry, one of the things that people frequently say is, you know, we can't run a randomized control trial. Well, okay, I agree. I actually think that's completely inappropriate um, and not the appropriate use of resources. But there are models from industry about continuous quality improvement and real-time feedback and change. And we need to actually, as scientists, be thinking differently about how to generate data in these contexts. Yes, uh, I'm Rita Sharon. Uh, among other things, I run the Columbia Commons, which is the interprofessional education and practice group here at Columbia. And I think the territoriality problem may exist among the professions. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of surprised to see the focus on this is what the nurses do, or not even that, this is what the nurse midwives do. And I, I think we're at a point where the teams have to be nimble enough that we're not talking from the hierarchies of one individual profession toward the, 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 the followers of that profession. We're mixing it all up. Mm -hmm. And especially if we're going to do what Larry says we need to do and really like get nimble mm -hmm. and able to, to, to respond, it can't be the nurses tell the nurses what to do and the doctors tell we can't do that. Thank you. I agree that territoriality, I think, is a constant problem, and I think it's part of human nature. We see it in, in every aspect. And I think uh, Ian's point about the WHO proves that in many ways. I, I agree that WHO was under-resourced and uh, lacked authority, and perhaps some of their duty. But at the same time, there were several different iterations of who was in charge, different organizations were set up at different times to um, lead the effort, as a result of which, of course, no one was really in charge, and as soon as someone managed to get a handle on it, another organization was brought in, a military organization, a governmental organization, NGOs, were brought in to take over. and. Uh, each time there was a new territoriality established. So I think we have to find some way to make this a more regular and practice this in advance, but make this a more regular operation so that whether under WHO auspices with a strong and more dedicated WHO, we're able to find a way to unite everyone. Thank you. Yeah, hi, uh, Beth Cameron from NTI. Um, so first, that was fantastic. Um, the question that I have is, is a true question. I, I, I don't know the answer to this, and I'm not a, a workforce pro, um, professional or guru. I'm among many in this room who might know the answer, including all of you. But do you think that the workforce target in the global health security agenda, in the new WHO external evaluations for pandemic preparedness, does it adequately include nursing, is it, is it incorporating a lot of the lessons learned that you spoke about? Frequently people focus on epidemiologists and contact tracing, but the community health workers, frontline health workers, nursing and midwives piece of this, I feel like isn't 
um, emphasized enough, but I do feel like there's a space within that community for more involvement to translate some of these pilot projects and lessons learned. I'm wondering what you think about that. I think it's much too generalized and not enough targeted, and it's why um, about shaking up the healthcare team, there needs to be a redistribution of power so that it is a flexible team. When we talk about tax sharing, it's usually task dumping. I mean, it's really thought of, well, nurses are going to tell doctors what to do because we do one thing. It's not a, a fluid, circular dynamic. And I do think by articulating, it does help to know when we, we look at guidelines about who's going to do what, that it gives direction. You know, this is a public health approach as we approach to non-communicable diseases. We're looking to how do you do it in a crunch time when it's rapid infection and fatality and you want to contain it and respond. But the same principles of how we work about going to the community, decentralizing, finding out what people think, involving them, empowering them in their own care, all apply. Because I think you, and we don't have a strong WHO, uh, CDC made many mistakes with Ebola in this country and its response. So, so how do we reshape this? But we have guidelines, we do. We know basic public health approach to uh, well-being for communities. And I'm arguing that yes, we need more articulation for the nursing sector. Okay, uh, our time is about up. We can continue the discussion. Uh, Ian, do you want to make one last comment? One quick question. Okay. Is nursing at all involved with Gorn? Apparently not, since we don't know what it is. <laughs> so there's a global outbreak alert response network uh -huh. in WHO that's responsible for sending people out to these areas. So we are a Gorn site um, at the CII. Mm -hmm. And if you would like to be part of that Gorn network, we're happy to bring you in. Thank you. That's Thank you. terrific. We're coming. All right. <laughs> and uh, uh, Wilma, could I just give one anecdote about mm -hmm. territoriality? It may sound totally irrelevant, but I think it's relevant. Uh, some years ago, I was in Montana visiting the Hutterites, which is a group of uh, like Mennonites. Uh, there are about 45,000 of them, and they only have five surnames, so they're beginning to get a lot of congenital problems, et cetera, which is why I was there. And our host, our hostess, was a young uh, Hutterite woman, 19, uh, starting to look for her mate. And she uh, said she was very concerned because they live in, it's a, it's a communistic society, they live in communes, and when you get up to two, a maximum of 250, you have to split off and start a new colony. So they were, uh, at that point, they were like 249 or 251 people. And uh, she said she didn't want to marry outside of her commune. And I said, why? And she said, because the polka dots on the um, hats of the women are different than ours and they look strange. So that's how territorial and how you know, we siloed we can get, and we think we might not be that way, but I think in many ways we are. Okay, thank you very much for that really fabulous discussion. Uh, le let me just say that in, in closing, that I, I served as a, a member of South Africa's parliament for eight years, and in my last incarnation I was responsible for health, and I was on the opposition side, so I essentially monitor what government does. Um, and during the Ebola outbreak, we let go of some of the adversarial uh, nature of the conflict between the governing party and the opposition party, because we, need, we knew we had to build a better system uh, in order to save lives and prevent death. So, and so it matters enormously, I mean, it ma matters enormously given this discussion on territoriality, that we really need to sort ourselves out because the consequence of bad governance, which is what we're talking about, we need a much better governance system when it comes to, and management system when it comes to emergency response because it matters in terms of lives lost. And so I have a slight impatience with it um, because we need to understand what our role is. People at universities are experts in their field they're not necessarily the people to govern interventions. 
and they're not the people to coordinate interventions, which is largely a government function. The World uh, Health Organization is the only body in the, in, in the entire globe that has a model authority to work with local governments. So it matters that we have a highly effective WHO. But the WHO, I think, uh, Larry is entirely right, is essentially a normative body. And its present um, effort to have emergency response uh, led by Peter Salama is a test for the system, okay? The, just think about this for a second. The annual budget of the Columbia University Medical Center is bigger than the global budget for the WHO. Okay, that's what it looks like. So that it's seriously under-resourced. So our task is to build a new system. And we have to build a new system in the vulnerable parts of the world in particular. And Africa is vulnerable and it's fragile. We have to build a system. That's the task. And I, I, was, I spent uh, Thanksgiving in Venice and they took us to the local cathedral, and it took 300 years to build that cathedral. And I thought about the first planning meeting, where they would sit on and say, hey, it's gonna take us 300 years. Well, they didn't know. To build this, this is the blueprint. Do you understand your task? We're the founding committee, um, because we're gonna be here for 10 more years. What we need to do is build a better global system we have the base for the architecture. The global health security agenda is a global structure. But it's, it's a body of governments. Not everybody belongs to it. The WHO has every government belonging to it. So that is why the global health security agenda and the WHO have come together so that we build a better system. That's our job. And nurses have a place in that system. And we had that discussion. Uh, the question of mental health is fundamentally important, under-recognized, we now recognize it as important. We need to build it into our response. The leadership that, that come from the nursing community uh, and other health professionals, yes. So before we start the next session, I wanted to um, ask um, Hannah Bender to please just uh, spend a minute speaking about the global health security agenda's next generation. All right, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for giving me a minute of your time. So uh, I'm Hannah Bender. I'm one of the research assistants for the Children's Hospitals in Africa Mapping Project, which you'll hear about a little later. And what I wanted to speak to you all about right now is the Global Health Security Agenda Next Generation Network. So this is uh, an interdisciplinary and international network of early to mid-career professionals as well as students. And the idea and the mission of the Global Health Security Next Gen is to um, connect um, students and early professionals to this broader network of people who are working in the field of global health security. Um, and so what we are going to do is start a chapter here at Columbia University, and so I wanted to take the opportunity to invite any students that might be in the room that would be interested in being a part of this organization, as well as uh, any faculty members who might know of some students who would be interested in participating. Some of the opportunities that are available through this network are, um, there's the NTI Next Gen um, biosecurity competition, wherein you can um, come up with uh, a proposal and potentially win funding for it, as well as the opportunity to attend the Global Health Security Ministerial Meeting, which uh, this year took place in Bali. And there are also opportunities for mentorship programs, as well as different webinars and other content in the field of global health security. So anyone who's interested, please feel free to reach out to me, and I would be happy to connect you with other people who are interested in starting this. So thank you. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Mark Rodman. I'm happy to be the facilitator of the next topic of biosafety and biosecurity in Africa. Before that, I just wanted to make some comments. Um, Wilmot, I want to thank you, of course, for your hard work. You are an aggregator of people um, without peer, and the ability to bring people together is not easy, and congratulate you, you on putting this morning's events together. 
You know, this makes me think of a conference that we put together back in April of 2017 on Zika infections. And at the time, that conference was made possible because of the leadership of someone named Steve Nicholas, who many of you know, who planned the conference, financed the conference, put everything together. And many of you participated in that conference, and what made it very special, I think, for all of you who were there, was the fact that it was very much like this. That it was just not a medical conference on the complications, which were just making themselves obvious at that time, but it was about the problems with detection, the problems to be able to go in and deal with the complications of it. We had someone from Brazil who was there talked about the mystery at the beginning of when this really was, in fact, a new outbreak and the problems that were associated with it. People who talked about vaccines and talked about all of this in terms of being a new focus of the global health security agenda. And at a discussion in April 2017, many of us stood around and we said, now, what's going to happen next? Because as Beth Cameron will talk about in her role at the time with the National Security Council and knowing that the birth of the global health security agenda as an outgrowth of the failures of the IHR, that there was a sense of moral leadership that the United States had in many, addressing many of these problems. And it was a new administration, and there were people from the new administration who were there. And we talked about what would really happen. What was going to happen now when that leadership perhaps was not there? And one of the things that we talked about, to me, that was obvious, was the potential role of the university. I've always had a personal belief that you leverage the hell out of everything you have to make something possible. And when you go and look in this room and the people who are speaking here, and you look about other universities, you see the enormous, enormous talent which is here and the challenge to be able to go in and oper operationalize the talents that's here for solutions. Given all of the challenges, all the territoriality that are there, you still get amazed by all the possible solutions and skill that we have here. And at that time, when you really have to think and question where we are without that moral leadership on a national level, what the role can be of the university to help fill that void and be able to provide some of those idea solutions that are otherwise be lacking. And what it takes, in many ways, is not only a willingness like the people here to go come from out without their own silos and work together for a larger narrative, but also it takes vision and leadership. So I think it's always important to remember that this collection today of the people that are here today from all different areas was an outgrowth of that first meeting about Zika in April 2017. And that in itself was an outgrowth of the vision and leadership of Steve Nicholas. And without his inspiration and leadership, then we wouldn't be here today in all likelihood. So I want to remember Steve and make knowledge of that and the fact that we need to learn from the past and we need to maintain that leadership, but that the vision is everything and can take us to goals that we otherwise would not really think possible. Uh, thank you for my uh, letting me go on like that. So we're going to go in and announce our next panel to be able to save, to save the time that we have and also to make up for the time that I just took. I'm going to ask the members of the next panel and the discussants to come up right now and join us here, and then each one of them can speak. I'll introduce them as we go, well, all of them now. Um, the next topic about biosafety and biosecurity in Africa is a little bit different. Because if you really can think about it, then I will propose this, is a continuum. We know about biosafety as to what we can do to protect healthcare workers, what we can do for best practices to protect people in our own field, whether it be in diagnostics, whether it be in providing primary care. Extending now with the concept of biosecurity, where how do we go in and protect ourselves from the own advances in biotechnology and in new infectious risks? in new synthetic biology programs that we will now begin to do, and what are the risks that we can go in that we may not really understand today 
and then leading ultimately to what do you do when some of those potential risks are turned against us by unsavory state, non-state actors who in fact use these advantages, advantages against the very people who we are trying to protect. So with that, we could not have a better panel than what we have right now. Um, Beth Cameron is the Vice President for Global Biological Policy and Programs at the Nuclear Threat Initiative, a leading organization that really addresses these larger issues. And in the past, was Senior Director for Global Health Security and Biodefense at the National Security Council and brings with her a history of how all of these areas emerged from IHR to the global health security agenda in the government back to where we are now. Andy Weber is now with the Council of Strategic Risks but was Assistant Secretary of Defense for Nuclear, Chemical and Biological Defense Programs and did a great deal of work in the DOD um, with the Ebola response who has the, uh, the specific perspective of, operation, of coming up and operationalizing the results, meaning he had to act to be able to prevent um, ongoing uh, extension of the, of the epidemic. Ian Lipkin is known by many of you, um, who is a professor of epidemiology and the director of the Center for Infection and, Immuno and Immunity at the Mailman School, but is well known from being on the cutting edge of multiple outbreaks and diagnostics, known for work that's done certainly here in this country as well as all over the country. Stephen Morse is our famed professor of epidemiology who has done extensive work on new outbreaks, certainly in influenza, but in early warning signs for new outbreaks. And Stephen Svitalnik is our professor of pathology um, and executive vice chairman of laboratory medicine, as, as we were talking, Steve, before runs the Columbia Laboratories, which I think somehow, as I mentioned, is more of a political position than a scientific one. I give you credit for being able to deal with this. Columbia always used to have a, another laboratory every 20 yards, so we're famous with that. So with that, I would like to go in and bring up Beth Cameron to come here, and we'll turn around and see your slides. Thank you very much. All right, first test is whether I can do this. Um, just the green button, I'm assuming? Yes, yes great, okay. Um, so first, thank you so much for inviting me here today, and thanks very much to Mark uh, for this great panel and to Wilmot uh, for getting us all here and to everyone who's participating. I love these kinds of events that bring together multidisciplinary actors and recognizing what Mark said is absolutely true, biosecurity and biosafety, it's a little different for, for, this, for this group. Um, what I am going to attempt to do is to talk about what I mean by biosecurity and biosafety, how it fits into the larger preparedness question. Um, and then uh, hopefully I'll also leave you with, many of you are working in your fields towards a safer and more secure world um, by looking at health security, by looking at health systems, by looking at sustainable development. Um, I'm going to talk today um, not about how we stop moving forward to meet those goals, but how we might think a little bit about building in safety and security um, as we think about new technologies and developments to meet those goals so that we don't end up inadvertently detracting from our ability to achieve the great goals that we've set for ourselves um, while we are on the path towards getting there. Um, I always like to point out this quote from Bill Gates, which came from a very uh, relatively unlikely place for a philanthropist like, like uh, Mr. Gates to be uh, representing. Uh, this was at the Munich Security Conference, largely a conference of defense and security professionals in Europe. And he said this last February, the next epidemic could originate on the computer screen of a terrorist intent on using genetic engineering to create a synthetic version of the smallpox virus. It, it's, a, it's a quote that has been controversial to some. If he had said it 10 years ago, it would have gotten a lot more controversial press uh, than it gets today, and I'll talk about why in a few minutes. Um, but I think it's important to realize that someone like him, who sits right in the middle of a career focused on technology, health systems, and sustainable development, is now thinking about biosafety and biosecurity. So I think it really puts this section of our agenda into context. So I won't speak a lot about the challenge because it's already been framed really well by Jennifer and others who went ahead of me. 
But the challenge that we're looking at when we think about global health security is dealing with naturally occurring disease threats, accidental laboratory releases, and deliberate attacks. And when I use the term uh, biosecurity, and Mark asked me to, to define the terms just because they're not always used the same way by everyone. When I use the term biosecurity, what I'm speaking about and what the WHO joint external evaluation uh, that now look at countries' preparedness uh, for pandemic threats, what, what they use as the definition is um, basically preventing um, the misuse of dangerous agents by those that would seek to do harm. And ways to do that include minimizing access to dangerous materials, um, thinking about technology transfer and access to expertise, and thinking about ways to minimize the likelihood in the future that states or terrorists would use, develop, create uh, biological weapons. When I speak about biosafety, I'm talking about preventing people that are working with um, dangerous agents from becoming infected or, or otherwise harmed by those agents. Um, and both of these things are often interpreted to mean in the laboratories. Certainly laboratory biosecurity and biosafety are critical, but we're also thinking about the broader context of biosecurity and biosafety from the time a sample is collected or a patient is seen through transport of those patients and samples all the way into the laboratory, storage or destruction of the agent. Regardless of the origin, of course, biological threats, unlike other weapons of mass destruction, uh, if they're a contagious agent is involved, of course can spread. And this leads to the possibility of millions being affected. Um, we also worry about political instability in a couple of different ways in pandemic crises, and it's already been mentioned um, in the last panel, but you can look at the Ebola outbreak of 2014. We were really lucky and really worried that none of the, really worried at the time that one of those three countries would collapse politically. And they didn't. They had three very strong leaders that were, were used to working together um, in that region of the world, and we were extremely lucky that that didn't happen. Now we have political instability in a different way unfolding in an insecure, with an Ebola outbreak in a very insecure region of the Democratic Republic of Congo. When you think about both of those settings of political instability and how outbreaks interact, you can think about um, safety and security um, and how they fit in. Of course, uh, travel and trade magnifies risks. I like this slide because it shows a single day, 200,000 flights and how really connected we are. So thinking about how to stop outbreaks from spreading by closing borders or, or stopping travel, it's, it's really, um, it's really uh, not gonna happen. And so we are all connected and that means that this um, challenge, this biodefense challenge, this biosecurity challenge, it's a global challenge and we need to tackle it as a global community. We know that terrorists are interested in biological weapons. I'm not going to talk a lot about this because Andy is the, one of the world's experts and he's coming after me. But this is a real challenge um, where we had, have recent uh, plots of ricin in Germany, where we've had groups like ISIS calling to recruit scientists with biological expertise. And we know that advances in technology are making it easier, cheaper, and faster um, to do great things with biology but also to do harmful things. And we need to be thinking about those two things at the same time. So um, I'm going to focus uh, most of my talk on biosafety and biosecurity with a specific emphasis in Africa. But I want to start by talking about lack of preparedness for pandemics writ large and then narrow in just a little bit. This is a great slide uh, put together by Resolve to Save Lives, a foundation that put together the Prevent Epidemics org website, and what it shows um, is both really good news, honestly, and really bad news. The good news in the slide is that up until 2015, no country in the world had been externally assessed for their pandemic preparedness, for their ability to meet the international health regulation requirements set out by the WHO. Today, over 80 countries have been assessed, and I think 100 countries or more are in the pipeline to be assessed. That's huge, that's great news. The bad news, of course, is that there are a lot of countries on this map that have not been assessed, and there's a lot of red and yellow um, reflecting uh, scores that have been achieved that are suboptimal and a lot of work to do. But at least we know now where the work is to be done. 
when you look, when you zoom in on this and you look specifically at Africa, it's also really good news, honestly, because almost every country in sub-Saharan Africa has done a joint external evaluation. This is tremendous leadership. There are countries in the world that have resisted these peer evaluations, have worried about being scored or judged because they were worried that if they showed up red, it would show something negative to the world. I make a point when I show this slide to say, this is positive. This is countries showing leadership, owning um, issues that, that need to be addressed. And the rest of the world should, um, in a commensurate way, respond to this transparency by providing more targeted assistance and actually prioritizing assistance for countries that have done the right thing and undergone these assessments. And you can see West Africa, of course, is, is actually, in this case, um, a shining bright light of transparency where almost every country in West Africa has, has done this or signed up. Um, is that sliver of the Gambia? That's a great question. I think it is the Gambia, but I will, it, it's not Guinea, I don't think it's Guinea Bissau. No. Who's, who's got the map of West Africa? This, this sliver? Yeah. This one? Yeah, I think that's. I think it's Gambia. Yeah. They're gray. They haven't done it yet. But that doesn't mean they haven't signed up. OK. Um, when you zoom in even further on this, and you look not at the overall pandemic preparedness composite scores, but you look at just biosecurity and biosafety, globally, the picture um, is that for this particular um, technical area, and there are 19 within the joint external evaluation, the scores are really low. Um, that's true also for the asterisk countries, which represent countries in Africa that had undergone and published the joint external evaluation as of June. And I should say this is the work of a great colleague, um, Simo Nakare from Finland and Ernesto Gozer from Peru, who mined the JEE scores to look specifically at the whole of government biosecurity and biosafety indicator. 70% of countries that have been assessed have little to no capability. Um, and that means there's a lot of work to do everywhere in the world. So we shouldn't kid ourselves. There are serious barriers here to improving biosafety and biosecurity um, in, in, within pandemic preparedness. But obviously, many of these barriers apply more broadly to health security. One, there's really limited resources. So in a resource-limited environment for pandemic preparedness, there's really limited resources for focusing on biosafety and biosecurity. And there's some good reasons for this. Um, if you have a dollar and you're sitting in a health ministry and people are dying of specific diseases, thinking about this issue um, is, is, and especially thinking about preventing um, a nefarious actor from doing something is not necessarily on the top of your agenda. And so this work really needs to be built in to the day-to-day -day work in the health system. Uh, there's also very few countries providing assistance in this area. I did a back of the envelope calculation about a year ago, and about two thirds of the biosecurity assistance provided globally is provided by the United States, and almost all of that is coming from our Department of Defense. While I too served at the Department of Defense, as did Andy, it's not sustainable for the biosafety and biosecurity assistance in the world that is conducted and, and put into the health systems in the world to be coming only or largely from the US Department of Defense. And so this is an area that really needs attention. Um, and it's an area that we're working on together through some activities I'll talk, talk to you about um, in a couple of minutes. Um, we aren't yet using um, all of the common metrics that I showed you. So while it's great that we now have these 19 technical areas, what would be even better is if every country in the world had a plan for how they were going to get better in each technical area. And then within that plan, if there were specific milestones for biosafety and biosecurity, in addition to all of the other indicators, like workforce development, um, for example, to go back to what the last panel was discussing. But many countries providing assistance aren't using these metrics yet, and that's another challenge. That means that there's little collective action. There's not great opportunities for donors and host governments to come together around common metrics and actually measure, measure change. In addition to this, um, the joint external evaluations don't really adequately address the fact that the technology landscape and the biological risks associated with that landscape 
are changing. Um, and this is because when those indicators were created, there really wasn't good consensus about how you would be able to measure whether a country had proper oversight for dual use research and how that, how that even that statement, dual use research, um, impacts different uh, pieces of the world that are doing different types of research or, different, or at different stages of biotechnology development. Um, this, reference, this slide references the um, horsepox creation and publication earlier this year showing for the first time what many of us knew uh, was possible that experts could recreate a virus very similar to smallpox. Looking at this um, now, um, at this stage um, in my career, uh, it just, it, it puts me where I never thought that I would be. So 15 years ago, when people were talking about this, I was thinking, dual use research, it's important, let's keep developing medical countermeasures, let's keep developing diagnostics. We still need to do those things, but we're now at the point where this is possible and it's going to get even more possible. So I think we need to start preparing ourselves for a world in which anything can be created, anything can be modified. What does that mean for preparedness? So I've thrown a whole lot of stuff on the table. I do that a lot. Um, the question really is, what can we do? What, do we, what can we do about this? So um, we did an experiment uh, this year, and we did this in conjunction with, with Dr. James um, and Columbia and with several other partners around the world. We launched something that we're calling the Global Biosecurity Dialogue. Um, and this was uh, launched as a non-governmental driven effort but specifically in service of multinational groups that are working within government so that it would have a home and a sustainability function. We're working with the Global Health Security Agenda's action package on biosecurity and biosafety. There are these action packages around all of the technical areas in GHSA, just waiting for groups to jump in and energize them. That's my plug for energizing other action package areas. Um, we also are working with the Global Partnership Against the Spread of Weapons and Materials of Mass Destruction, which is a G7 group of now, I think, over 30 countries that are focused on security risks um, associated with uh, weapons of mass destruction. Um, and what we asked ourselves was, how can we infuse some new energy into the global conversation around biosecurity and biosafety? Um, in, in specifically, how could we identify barriers and spur collective action around these new targets that we have in place? And then how can we hold accountable those that make commitments for actually following through on them? So we launched this effort in June, and coming out of that meeting, um, we got agreement on three areas that we should be focusing on, barriers and acceleration of policy frameworks that work for improving biosecurity and biosafety, national and regional capabilities um, in line with the external evaluation targets in the joint external evaluation, and emerging biological risks, including those associated with advances in technology. Um, and we identified a bunch of new things, but one of the things that came out of that meeting was a real interest from the African Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, who are now building six regional hubs around the African continent, including building laboratory capability and, and workforce requirements. They were very interested on the ground floor of this effort in building in sustainable practices for biosafety and biosecurity and helping countries be able to reach those biosecurity goals as they develop their national action plans. And so one of the things that we've been doing with a lot of assistance um, from Wilmot is working on a concept note with the African CDC um, planning our, our next activities for, for, um, for the coming year to include um, a meeting in Addis Ababa, uh, where the African Union is located, and to start talking about different tiers of approaches where we're building political will amongst leaders in Africa while at the same time engaging technical experts to be able to do the nuts and bolts work of developing these biosecurity milestones in the national action plans. So in my remaining maybe two minutes, um, I wanted to also address this additional challenge that I threw on the table um, of, of how to engage um, experts who may be outside of government in reducing risks associated with advances in tech. Uh, because one of the challenges with the emerging risk side of the biosecurity equation is that um, as technology develops, we have equitable access issues that need to be kept in mind around the world. 
And also, scientific advances are really outpacing the ability of governments to provide effective oversight. So I saw this firsthand from my work in the US government on dual-use research regulations. Almost as soon as you put them out there, they're out of date. The technology advances further. They're not nimble enough. Um, and it's really hard to evaluate how successful they are. That doesn't mean we shouldn't have them. And I actually think more governments should have policies about dual-use research that are formal and on the books. But what I think it really means is that it's more and more incumbent on those experts developing new technologies, those um, investors who are funding it, to be building in biosecurity and biosafety along the way and figuring out some new ways to do that that are creative and harness technology innovation as opposed to stopping it. And so um, in light of that, one of the other efforts that we're now working on um, includes putting together um, some pilot activities with um, absolutely specifically non-governmental leaders from around the world to look at how we might be able um, to catalyze better practices and more sustainable um, biosecurity innovation. One of the efforts that's outlined in orange at the bottom is a concept that we're working on with Columbia University on the potential to develop a seal of approval that would incentivize um, adherence to biosecurity norms. And what I mean by that, it's kind of a wonky phrase, is we have made a lot of progress um, over the last 10 years in developing standards for laboratory bio-risk management. But there isn't really an analogy or a way for researchers who are doing experiments with dangerous agents to know when they're working with or to incentivize them to work with others who are also thinking about dual use issues as they're developing and conducting their experiments. We wanted to pilot an award or a seal of approval approach that could be, um, that could be a, a um, partnership between Columbia and other universities around the world to be able to, to um, incentivize this kind of practice. And so uh, what I would love to see come out of this project is um, a concept that could be developed and, um, and catalyzed in more, than, in more than one area, and particularly with um, partners in Africa. We've been working with, um, with uh, the Institute Pasteur in Dakar, Senegal, on this project as well as others. And so one of the meetings I'm looking forward to later today is to talk about how to build this out. So just to end, um, I wanted to make a point to bring back to this issue of multidisciplinary meetings like this one and why, why they're so important. So I view bio, biosecurity as a very integral piece of health security, which is obviously one piece of the larger health system, which is important to achieving universal health coverage, which is important to meeting the sustainable development goals. But by and large, these bars on the right, when we have meetings, we're still having siloed meetings about all of these topics. And I think that we need to have more discussions where we actually blend together, how these th blend together the people that work on these issues to talk about how they interrelate and how we need to make progress on all of them in order to achieve our mutual goal, which is a safer and more secure world. I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you, um, <clears throat> Beth, that was great. And uh, the leadership that, that Beth uh, represents is just amazing in this, in this area. Thank you, Wilmot, for putting this group together, and Mark, and everyone involved, um, Hannah and Noel. It, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's very important that these different communities work together, forget about territorialism for a day, and focus on the mission. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, deliberate bio threats uh, based on some of my experiences. Try to try to make it not just a hypothetical discussion, but share some of my um, on the ground uh, uh, exposure to uh, to biological weapons through my work in government and, and the work that I continue to do on what I consider this most important uh, 21st century. A national and global security issue. So uh, 20, uh, 23 years ago, um, I was a young diplomat in Kazakhstan, 
and I led uh, a team of American experts uh, to this site in uh, northeastern uh, Kazakhstan, just over the Russian border. Um, this building behind me, two football fields long, was the world's largest anthrax weapons factory. Uh, it was in a place called Stepnogorsk. Kazakhstan, which was a secret city, it just had a post office box number, did not appear on maps. And um, uh, frankly, my first visit uh, to this facility really changed my life and, and the, the direction of my career, and uh, it made this threat of biological weapons uh, very, very uh, real uh, and compelling to me. And, and um, you can see the, the bunker system in the foreground where they actually would have loaded the, uh, the anthrax agent onto uh, different kinds of weapons, bombs, missiles. Uh, this is inside that facility, um, one four-story high, 20,000 liter, approximately 5,000 gal gallon uh, bioreactor fermenter, um, one of 10 that was, would, would have been used to produce during a mobilization period, a wartime mobilization period of about eight months. 300 metric tons of anthrax agent. Um, the entire fermentation hall inside the middle of that building was at biosafety level four, high containment with breathable air. Uh, the scale of this facility can only be described as, uh, as evil. And uh, through the, the leadership of Kazakhstan and its uh, President Nazarbayev, who renounced weapons of mass destruction uh, and worked with the United States to deal with that legacy in a safe and environmentally sound way. Where that building once stood is just uh, green grass. Well, this time of year it would be white snow. Um, but it was safely destroyed and will no longer um, represent a threat. But the uh, Soviet Union and Steve Morse and I visited and, and, and Beth many facilities that worked on biological weapons, uh, including the Vector Laboratory in Siberia that uh, perfected smallpox as a weapon after the eradication was over. Um, we had the Biological Weapons Convention go into force in 1975, but that anthrax factory was built in the 80s. President Nixon ended the U.S. biological weapons program in 1969, and the Soviet Union saw that as a potential area of advantage, and they created this massive uh, secret program. But um, especially after 9-11, but even before, we became very concerned about terrorist use of biological weapons. Um, in 1995, the same time I visited for the first time that anthrax factory, the Amshinrikyo cult in Japan launched not just the sarin chemical weapons attacks, but also attacks with anthrax. And the only reason we didn't know about those attacks at the time is because they failed to kill people. They used a vaccine strain of anthrax and tried to make it more virulent instead of starting with a virulent uh, uh, strain of Bacillus anthracis. Everything else, wep weaponization, dispersal, they did very well. Um, so that tells me the importance of keeping these starter cultures out of the hands of those who would use uh, them to develop biological weapons. Uh, more recently, uh, in the Inspire magazine of Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, they put out a call to brothers with degrees in chemistry and microbiology to develop weapons of mass destruction. So we know the intent of many of these terrorist groups is there to develop biological weapons. They seem to fail repeatedly on getting the starter cultures, which tells me that if we can consolidate and minimize access to uh, these dangerous bacteria and viruses, we have a chance to prevent a catastrophe, and that's why the biosecurity component of the global health security agenda is so vital, because we really do have an opportunity 
uh, Bill Gates uh, is seized with this issue. And then, as Beth described, uh, the democratization of, of new technologies, synthetic biology, gene editing, open new possibilities for developing not just the traditional biological weapons, but even more uh, horrific uh, potential biological weapons. The synthesis of horsepox in, uh, in Alberta, Canada is an example of, of not just what's hypothetically possible, but they actually did it. They did it in about six months for $100,000, and that was last year. Um, the cost of um, synthetic biology keeps declining rapidly, uh, almost uh, at a rate faster than, than Moore's law. So um, these, uh, these new technologies, these advanced threats are something we need to be concerned about. And in a terrorist context, uh, probably not today, but in five, 10 years. Um, after uh, the 9-11 attacks, we had our own Amerithrax experience. And we tend to draw the wrong lessons from that. Um, this was one lone wolf terrorist. He was a, a researcher at a US Department of Defense laboratory in, in Maryland, at Fort Detrick. It took the FBI eight years to catch him. And he, on his own, developed and produced, and then uh, I don't think he intended to kill people with it, but he delivered via the US Postal Service anthrax that was a very high quality weaponized grade of anthrax that could have killed tens of thousands of people. That was not his intent, clearly. But indeed, thankfully, uh, five people uh, died. Uh, and, and the reason for the low number, relatively low number of deaths was that he wrote a letter he said, you've been exposed to anthrax, take penicillin. And indeed, we put 30,000 people who were potentially exposed on uh, Cipro antibiotics. And those who know about the disease of anthrax, if you're symptomatic and have been exposed to inhalational anthrax, it's extremely hard to treat. So that early warning that he actually provided himself allowed us to save an enormous number of of lives. We'll never know how many lives um, we saved. And this is what I call the supply side of weapons of mass destruction terrorism. And I've worked on nuclear terrorism. We've done a lot in the last 25 years to reduce the number of uh, facilities and countries that have uh, significant quantities that you would need to develop a nuclear bomb or a nuclear uh, device. Um, but in the bioweapons context, really we're talking about pathogens and people with expertise who, who know how to work on pathogens. That's the supply side of bioterrorism and bioweapons. And we didn't have it mapped in our country. When the anthrax attacks occurred here, our own FBI did not know which facilities in the United States of America even had Bacillus anthracis uh, stored or were working on it, and who, which people, um, had access to these dangerous pathogens. We've come a long way. We still make some, some big mistakes, but we've come a long way. We have a select agent program. But what Beth is talking about, many countries in other parts of the world, um, and most of the countries in Africa, don't have national systems analogous to our select agent program to, to have an inventory, to know which facilities have these dangerous strains, to know which people have access to them. And I think that knowledge um, is critical to preventing a catastrophe to keeping the starter cultures out of the hands of those with ill intent. Um, we did a lot of work uh, through the Department of Defense Nun Luger program, starting with dealing with the legacy of the collapse of the Soviet Union. But then we realized that, especially in the 
biological weapons area, we needed to think globally because every country in the world has a biological weapons uh, capability. They don't have the intent at the government level, but um, the materials, the expertise reside inside these countries and they allow uh, potentially non-state actors to exploit that vulnerability and develop uh, biological weapons. So for example, in Tbilisi, Georgia, we built the National Center for Disease Control to help Georgia improve its monitoring of infectious diseases and also to provide a secure facility with biosafety level three. And we closed down um, uh, work on anthrax and plague and other endemic diseases in Georgia at smaller laboratories scattered around the country and then focus it in this one very good facility with, with a quite uh, uh, reasonable security, trained personnel, and good uh, biosafety practices. There's a lot we can do, and Ian will, will address this, um, culture-independent diagnostics. You know, the old dangerous way of, of diagnostics is to culture the virus or the bacteria. Um, but now we have fast, better, cheaper molecular methods, more precise, that allow people to do that job more efficiently. Uh, for example, we visited a, a veterinary laboratory in uh, Uganda that had been dealing with a die-off of hippos in one of the national parks. And it they had taken samples from the hippos to try to determine the cause, and indeed it was anthrax. And they had a freezer full of samples. And they never thought, well, maybe this could be exploited, that, that, that perhaps we shouldn't keep these samples in our freezers. Um, so there's a lot we can do at very low cost by increasing awareness, by having national policies that are integrated, that include law enforcement and, and other parts of the government that focus on counterterrorism. And, and domestic security. Time is everything. Early warning is everything. So rapid diagnostics that report into a system of biosurveillance is the key to saving lives. Every day that we know earlier that an attack has occurred, we have the ability to save more lives. Um, I can't overemphasize the importance of this in the Ebola response, which I was involved in helping to coordinate the international response. Uh, the data side was a disaster. There was poor data sharing, there was data hoarding, and then there was just using uh, paper-based systems that, that nobody could uh, could benefit from the data that was being collected. It went into a black hole. Um, we're doing a little better now with some of the systems, the one that Giannis described as an example of that. But having diagnostics linked to the cloud, reporting data real time from the test systems will increase that awareness and allow us to, to save more lives. It also needs to be used day to day for routine diseases. It can't just be a PCR in a box waiting for a crisis. And that's why looking at the horses as well as the zebras is really the key to uh, identifying the zebras early. Um, a little bit about state biological weapons programs. North Korea has a very advanced biological weapons program that is leveraging the cutting edge of science and technology. Um, we became very concerned about this and started an exercise program in South Korea to prepare for and deter um, the use of biological weapons uh, in uh, covert use in South Korea by the North Korean state. We've, we vaccinated all our U.S. soldiers for smallpox and anthrax who are serving in that region of the world because we're that concerned about the potential threat. The um, North Koreans actually used a chemical weapon, VX, in Kuala Lumpur in an assassination operation to kill uh, Kim Jong-un's uh, half-brother. 
But this is a new phenomenon. This is state-supported and executed covert use of weapons of mass destruction. Now, in this case, it was for an assassination, but that same capability could be used to kill tens or hundreds of thousands of people in a city anywhere in the world. Even here in New York, uh, North Korea could retaliate against a military um, strike in North Korea here in New York with anthrax. Um, you know, they have an embassy here. It's uh, easy for them to smuggle it into the country. Another a more recent example of uh, this uh, state sponsor. So with terrorist groups, there's been a capability gap. They have not succeeded in launching a, a large attack with a weapon of mass destruction, either chemical weapons, biological weapons, or uh, God forbid, a nuclear device. But when you have a state behind it, like Russia or North Korea, the capability problem goes away. They have an advanced capability. One issue that I want to call your attention to, because it's also very real, uh, those of you who follow the opioid crisis know that fentanyls are causing a lot of deaths, that they're uh, coming in through the, the dark web and the, and the postal service from laboratories in China. Uh, so there's a market for uh, some of these uh, fentanyl analogs, which are extraordinarily lethal. But what people don't know in the public health community is that fentanyls are a chemical weapon. The Russian special forces, when there was a Chechen uh, hostage taking in a theater uh, in Moscow, they pumped fentanyls into the theater and they killed all the hostage takers, but they also killed over 100 of the hostages because the, the medical responders on scene didn't know they were using fentanyls. And so they didn't have any, uh, any treatment options available. But now imagine a terrorist group that has the intent to conduct a mass killing can just buy a weapon of mass destruction. That is a, is a game changer. It's one we need to think about. Imagine um, dispersion of fentanyls in a, in a stadium or a subway. Um, it's something that we're not prepared for. And then I mentioned the Salisbury attack uh, in the UK, where Russians used a very advanced chemical weapon, the Novichok series agent, in that um, bungled uh, attack. So the message, you know, the territoriality is, is the problem. The solution is getting these different communities to work together. That's why Beth, the mother of the global health Security agenda, that's why we created the Global Health Security Agenda, was to get this multi-sectoral approach to break down barriers. I think exercises are really important, you know, in peacetime, to do exercises, to get people used to working together, to build capacity. It's essential. And the healthcare workers, and many of you, are the front line for dealing with deliberate biological attacks, whether you like it or not. Um, you are the front line. And much of what you can do to, to better respond to natural outbreaks also applies to the potential for deliberate attacks. So you may recognize one person in this picture. I was younger. I had a little bit, of, little bit more hair, not much on top of my head. Uh, this was a trip in 2005 that I took with a young senator from Illinois to a, and we're in a health laboratory in Kiev, Ukraine. And in, in my hand from that freezer, kitchen-like kitchen freezer behind me is uh, Bacillus anthracis. And um, that's why um, I just want to leave you all with, uh, with a request uh, that in, in each of your um, careers and, and what you do that you uh, think about the day after we've had a mass terrorist attack um, somewhere in the world. And what is it that we'll wish but for a lack of imagination that we could have done to have prevented it 
or to be better prepared uh, to deal with it. And, and think about it that way, and that will uh, allow you as leaders in this field to help bring about the, the changes so we can prevent what is a preventable catastrophe. And I also believe that with current developments in science and technology, we can make biological weapons as a class of weapons absolutely obsolete and just take them off the table. So thank you for your leadership. Thank you. My question, Andy, is why weren't you wearing gloves? I was vaccinated. <laughs> I'm going to talk with you about some of the tools uh, that you can use to identify infectious agents and track epidemics, and then I'll give you a few vignettes from some of the work that we've done over the past a few years. Um, this is uh, John Snow's map of London in the 1850s. And many of you will remember that there was a cholera outbreak that he ultimately linked to the presence of this pump, and people who used that pump. And there's a story that he broke off the pump handle, which arrested the outbreak, which, of course, is not true. I don't have no idea whether or not he broke off the pump handle. And at the time this, this link was recognized, it was already on the way. But nonetheless, the pump handle is very important. It's actually not in Broad Street, although you'll see a pump in Broad Street. The original pump is actually in the London School. So if you want to see it, you have to actually go to London School to see it, where it's in a faculty office. <laughs> and we've covered um, biodefense, and we've talked a little bit about uh, emerging infectious diseases. This is to illustrate the point that the vast majority of emerging infectious diseases, which are illustrated in red, are those agents that originate in wildlife. And there are lots of efforts to characterize infectious agents in wildlife for that particular reason. And the modern day John Snows or Jane Snows use sequencers. So when I began this sort of work, which was in the, really in the mid 1980s, trying to identify infectious agents, perplexed by the fact that it took two years to figure out the cause of HIV, AIDS, I used subtractive cloning. This is before we had ready access to sequencing and in contrast, with all of these tools now, you can rapidly identify, identify a wide range of infectious agents. Now, Andy mentioned a moment ago that the methods are becoming increasingly robust, and I'm just going to describe two tools which have reduced the cost still further beyond what we all know with unbiased high-throughput sequencing. If you capture the relevant nucleic acids with oligonucleotides at a couple of magnetic beads, you can achieve extraordinary sensitivity, the same sort of sensitivity you get with real-time PCR. So one to 10 copies of nucleic acid. And this is an example which illustrates to this point our ability to detect flu and enteroviruses and MERS and dengue viruses and Ebola and so forth, two to three order of magnitude more sensitive than the unbiased high throughput sequencing, which is now sort of considered to be state of the art. This particular method is no longer restricted to laboratories. Uh, we're now using this. We've licensed it for research purposes, and uh, Steve Fotolnik and his group are piloting the development of this particular technology in the Clinical Microbiology Center here at CUMC. You can use similar sorts of methods for bacteria, not only identifying bacteria, but also characterizing antimicrobial resistance. And this is an example comparing high throughput sequencing versus what we achieve with the capture method. As you can see, it's much more sensitive. Now, these were all with systems where we knew how much we were placing in for analysis. I'll show you some examples from clinical medicine as well. You can also use these tools to identify genes that are upregulated in the presence of an antibiotic. And the notion here would be that instead of having weight for culture, you could identify antimicrobial resistance profiles within a period of three to four hours from the time that the actual clinical specimen is obtained. We've discovered over 1,200 viruses over the past several years. 
5% of them are clinically relevant, and by that I mean associated with diseases which are important for humans or wildlife. So there's a lot of uncharted territory, and I'll, I'll tell you just how much shortly. This is an example of how we've used these sorts of approaches vis-a-vis -vis unbiased high throughput sequencing. These were all samples that were reputed to be negative in Uganda. We found a wide variety of different viruses, including an influenza virus that was not detected by PCR. So PCR is not as sensitive um, as people predict it to be. We've also been able to use it in cephalitis, and I'll show you some recent work in, um, in India where we identified bacteria that were important as well. So in a third of the CSF samples where we were looking at materials that had been uh, characterized extensively using other methods, we were able to find a virus that was potentially important. The other thing that I want to emphasize is that when an agent is no longer present, you can still find footprints of its present by using serology. These are microarrays with roughly 3 million features, peptides representing the entire proteome of viruses or a portion that's relevant for bacteria. And you can use these then to define epitopes that can be migrated to other platforms that are less expensive, like lateral flow assays or ELISAs and so forth. And we use this with Zika, and we're able to find a peptide which is only eight amino acid residues in length, which distinguishes Zika from West Nile virus and dengue viruses. So it's a really very, very powerful sort of an approach. And it has also allowed us in Lyme disease to get a one-stop test where a patient provides a sample, you get the equivalent of the ELISA with the follow-up Western blot, and because it's multiplexed, you can identify immunoreactivity with a wide range of different infectious agents. And I think this is going to be the way uh, this sort of work will be proceeding in the future. The other thing we've not talked about today that I always try to emphasize is food security. Uh, so this illustrates two points. One is food security. And we've done similar work with salmon where we found a novel virus that led to the development of a vaccine that has protected salmon stocks worldwide. This was a tilapia virus that would have not have been found using the method that I just described because it's so different. Tilapia are extraordinarily important. This is a, a map that illustrates all the various places where you have farms. And these are wiped out um, by this particular virus, which is a novel orthomyxo-like virus, somewhat similar to flu, that causes hep hepatosplenomegaly and CNS disease, and the fish die. And it's cost billions of dollars thus far for some reason, I'm jumping. OK, so when we began looking at the, at the sequences that came out of this analysis, we were able to take <clears throat> the sequence of the tilapia fish, subtract it, and we identified 10 gene segments that didn't find any homology in any known database to any known viruses, but they had similarities at the termini. So virologists know that that typically is a clue, the fact that there might be a polymerase that binds to each of these regions and replicates it. And the only similarity that we found was this influenza C PB1, which is a polymerase sequence found in an influenza C. But when we went back and did electron microscopy, you can see these classical sort of uh, spheroid particles and with in situ hybridization, demonstration of the virus in the liver and in the heart. Now, how many viruses are there left to be characterized? Uh, now, early on, Steve Morse, it's about 15 years ago, maybe even more, Steve, was it 20 years ago, that you published an estimate of about a million viruses that were yet to be discovered. So we decided to approach this um, experimentally by looking in one area we, where we had a lot of data. We chose one animal species, Teropus giganius, uh, the, the giant flying fox. And we did this work in Bangladesh where we had the ability to get materials from not only animals but also from people. And we only use consensus PCR for these assays, and we identified 55 viruses in these animals. 50 of them were novel. You can see the breakdown here. Uh, coronaviruses uh, were not as popular as I thought they might be. And then we extrapolated, looking back at if we'd sampled with fewer animals, 
what would it have taken to saturate the discovery curve? We extrapolated from that finding to the number of mammalian species and decided that there were a minimum of 320,000 viruses to be discovered just with consensus PCR. So Steve, your estimate was probably close to on target. Um, this is being used as an argument for something called the Global Virome Project because, as you know, the cost for SARS and Ebola and all these other uh, outbreaks and pandemics and so forth are extremely expensive. And if we could simply identify all the viruses, maybe we'd get a leg up on, you know, the next pandemic. But in fact, we don't have any good way of knowing, based on sequence alone, whether or not something has already moved into the human population. That's where serology comes in. Now I'm going to tell you about an experience in South Africa, which is probably the most lethal virus that's been discovered to date, and it's the outbreak that never went anywhere because it was contained rapidly. This was in an individual um, who traveled from Zambia to South Africa. The name of the virus is Lujo because it's a contraction of Lusaka and Johannesburg. And Janusz Poweska, who was in South Africa, and we collaborated on characterizing this virus. And this is the story of this particular outbreak. There was a travel agent who was on safari. She became very ill. She was airlifted from Lusaka to Johannesburg. The paramedic on the plane became infected. The nurse who took care of the individuals, these two individuals on the other side, became infected. And the person who cleaned the room became infected. All four of these people died. Now, this nurse who was taking care of the people who became infected in Johannesburg was treated with ribavirin because we identified the agent as a novel arena virus. She alone survived. So in fact, this was probably 100% mortality, which is much more lethal than Ebola. And what we found was this virus, which was intermediate between the new world and the old world arena viruses. We still don't know the reservoir for this virus, and we've not seen another outbreak. But if it were to get out there, at least we know that it's responsible, that it's responsive to ribavirin. This is a little bit of an example of recent work that we've done in Saudi Arabia beginning really in 2012 when we had the first case uh, of a man who had hypertension and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. The agent was identified. The question was, where did the agent come from? So the Ministry of Health of Saudi Arabia brought us in to try to identify the reservoirs. The man who was the index case had four camels. We examined um, his, uh, his house, his place of business as well as his house. He lived in Bisha. I'll just fast forward through much of this uh, to show you that we found that there were uh, bats that were infected with this virus. There was one from which we covered genomic sequence. Um, these are examples of the bats that we found in some of these old ruins. But this was really, this is right in back of his, where he worked. We swabbed his camels because the number of bats that we found that were infected was very, very few. The bats were also positive. Uh, this is an example of the work from the bat showing where we found uh, the infected animal relative to the case. In order to analyze these samples, because we could not bring back ungulate materials to the US because of concerns about the foot and mouth disease virus, we sent a team out to the desert with ELISAs and thermal cyclers and various other sorts of things. And what we learned was the following. In surveying much of Saudi Arabia, including this area which is known as the Empty Quarter, we identified 95% of adult camels as having antibodies to MERS coronavirus. Juveniles were somewhat less commonly infected. Overall, 75% of the animals in the kingdom were infected. When we look, went looking for nucleic acids, what we found was that, sorry here, was that juveniles were much more likely to be infected than adults. This is very similar to coronavirus infections of children or of cattle. You get infected early. This is when the shedding occurred. Now, when we released those data, we were told that the vast majority of cases had no contact with camels. But we subsequently identified and have a paper that's now in press that shows that meats are contaminated in Saudi Arabia 
and the rate of contamination is a function of how they prepare their meat. So if they actually wash the meats extensively before they're shrink wrapped and sent to supermarkets, they're relatively free of virus. But if not, you could potentially become infected and because the slaughter lines for sheep and goats and camels are adjacent to one another, you have opportunities for cross-contamination. The last thing that I'm going to um, talk about is the way we've taken all this together, the serology, the molecular biology to characterize this outbreak of encephalitis in children in Uttar Pradesh. This is a very, um, this is an awful sort of an outbreak. There are tens of thousands of children who become infected. They are a group of children in the Musahars. These are uh, a tribal group that's actually not even uh, represented well within the Dalit caste. And every time you have a flood, you wind up with increases in ticks and rodents and so forth. When we went looking using Vercapseq, Vert, and Backcapseq, the two systems that we described, using materials that we brought back, examining spinal fluid, we found that the vast majority of these children who had been previously worked up by several large international agencies had no infectious agents. We were able to recover evidence of an infectious agent, and sometimes more than one in almost two-thirds of cases. When we then went back and looked at brain materials, we found that these, which had also been negative, contained two bacteria, Orientia tsutsugamushi and Rickettsia felis. This has already resulted, these data, in the, um, in the implementation now of tetracyclines when children have unexplained encephalitis in this portion of northern India. So I've tried to give you a sort of a snapshot of various approaches that you can use, and uh, I'm just acknowledging here the various people who do the actual work, because it's certainly not me. Thank you. I want to thank all of the speakers for three insightful presentations, and I was hoping that everyone come up and join us here. And before I turn this over to Steve and Steve to comment on some of the presentations, I just would like to make one comment in kind of maybe providing some context. There is a number of topics that we cover today in different parts of the presentations. We talk about biodetection, which is what Ian talked about, about using newer technologies to come up and facing and looking for new infective agents that we would not otherwise have known. We look about biosurveillance that has come out throughout the, all of these talks about how you know about these new outbreaks and get them into a collective knowledge base so you can be able to learn from that and how it affects other parts of the country. We touched a little bit on biosafety, which is good practices, which will come on as there are more laboratories that will exist certainly on the continent of Africa. And Beth talked a lot about biosecurity which is where we are, which is a newer realized threat, which is how our advances can potentially be turned against us and what safeguards can be put in place to prevent those from happening. And finally, Andy talked about bioterrorism, <laughs> which is how other threats can be used against the population. So we have a lot of bios here. And one of the things that I would go put out there to talk about is how are they related how does the governance different among approaching the problem? And how do they get funded differently? So I just want to put that and put it in perspective. And Steve, you're closer to me. I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And this has been a fascinating session. A fascinating. of the themes brought up earlier, thank you. And in fact, um, the importance of human capacity uh, has come up a number of times, the problem of territorialism and of people's need to get together as opposed to the fragmentation we often see at every level 
um, I think has been a, a theme that has come out very strongly in both of today's sessions. From almost the dawn of history, people have been fascinated by the power of infectious diseases that occur in nature. And as a result, they've attempted to harness that power as they have other powers for other ends, to, for, to dominate, to take over new territories, or perhaps to gain advantage or even to kill their enemies. And we see this no less today, but the means of doing this have changed. So in the past, people attempted to harness natural infections in various ways to do this. But as um, several of our speakers pointed out, all of the bioterrorist and biowarfare agents originally began as natural, usually zoonotic infections. And although there are new technologies that um, are on the forefront, Beth Cameron mentioned a number of technologies that might offer new threats. There still remain threats from the uh, existing infectious diseases. And so I think Beth, Cameron made a very good case for the importance of the global health security agenda in strengthening not only biosecurity and protection from intentional misuse, but also the very clear overlap with health security in general and the need to protect people against natural outbreaks of infectious diseases, which we've heard about and which has been exemplified many times with Ebola and other examples. And indeed, they're very closely related because the Ebola outbreak right now in uh, the Congo, in Eastern Congo, is occurring in a severe conflict zone. And so have many Ebola outbreaks in the past, one of the original ones in the Congo and in what is now South Sudan. So there is great room for dealing with the global health security agenda and putting these uh, pieces together for collective action and collective leadership, which uh, Beth particularly stressed. And I think it's particularly encouraging to see that something is being done there, and I hope sustained. Andy Weber talked about the fact that it's not only possible to do biowarfare and bioterrorism, but that in recent years, a number of states have been able to adapt this to the industrial scale, as we see the industrialization of microbiology that occurred uh, between the wars and just after the Second World War, giving way more recently to what Freeman Dyson called the domestication of technology as it becomes more and more possible for many of these technologies to, especially biotechnologies, to be done on a smaller scale. And again, as was pointed out, Africa is rich in natural resources, including many emerging infections and many infectious diseases like Ebola and many others that could concern us. But unfortunately resource poor, and there's a need not only for the development of norms and of methods for dealing with these crises, but also on a sustainable basis, the essential role for biosurveillance and building both laboratory and biosurveillance capacity. Finally, Dr. Lipkin, Ian Lipkin, talked about the importance of technology and how technologies, uh, which in some ways can present new challenges and new threats, can also provide, as we heard also in the previous session, new opportunities for being able to diagnose and identify not only the threats that we see causing disease, but those that might be out there on the edge of causing disease or becoming the next emerging infection. And when these become available at uh, more widely, 
and when the resources become available, these very advanced technologies can point the way to new discoveries in uh, both disease and the prevention of disease. But questions remain, and as Dr. Larson said in her initial um, discussion, questions remain, how do we govern? How do we put the pieces together to govern these efforts? The global health security agenda provides one, but it's had its ups and downs, and I think it requires sustainability, as we've heard, and the desire to apply this across the board, not to see biosecurity as a problem in isolation, but as part of a broader problem, which includes the need to uh, the very encouraging improvement in laboratories, which I'll leave to Dr. Spitalnik to discuss, and the fact that for the first time we are seeing evaluations of laboratories and the attempts to build laboratory capacity. But that requires a sustainable workforce and sustainable political commitment. And how that's going to happen is I think a need that we are all trying to wrestle with as we think about the dual use problem. And those of us who've dealt with the dual use problem recognize that these solutions do have to be global, but that none of them right now represent global solutions, which can probably be done, as our earlier speakers indicated, only through norms, education, and development of the appropriate consciousness. And with that, I, I thank the, the speakers and all of you and turn the discussion over to Dr. Spitalnik. Hi, thanks. Um, I thought these were three terrific talks. I, I learned a lot. Um, I also learned two people who I didn't know before who I'm going to contact the next time I need them. And, and I'll explain why in, in a second. So, so I'm not exactly what I'm supposed, I'm not exactly sure what I'm supposed to do, but I'll, I'll give you some perspective and reaction to the talks, um, which is that my focus uh, necessarily is local, not global. Um, and, and I run all the clinical labs at Columbia, and so we have about, between pediatrics and adults, it's about a thousand bed hospital, has a large outpatient uh, population, and our main clinical laboratory receives 10,000 samples a day, and we also process, these are blood, urine, and things like that, and we also process about 200 tissue samples a day from biopsies or, or surgical procedures. So a lot of stuff flows through our labs. And in 2014, when I didn't know you guys, uh, the, the question was, what do we do when a, a passenger gets off a plane at JFK and arrives in our emergency department with a fever? That's it. Okay? Do they have Ebola? Do they not have Ebola? Who's going to touch that patient? Who's going to talk to that patient? Uh, do we quarantine every patient with a fever? Who's going to draw blood from that patient? This is a blood-borne pathogen. Um, where does that blood go? Who touches it? Who does a laboratory test on it? Where does the sample go after it's a t the test is done? We have 10,000 samples. Imagine how easy it would be for one of our technologists, and we have 700 or so employees, to take that specimen out of a refrigerator, walk out of the lab, and give it to their local ISIS uh, commander or whatever. Um, we were not prepared, and, and the, the conversations were frightening in the depth of ignorance and the vast differences of opinion. From people telling me that my phlebotomist should just go draw blood from the patient and we should work with it in our open laboratory because after all, we use universal precautions. We do use universal precautions, but they're based on the diseases we tend to see, the most serious of which would be HIV and, and hepatitis C virus. And the, the PPE, which you weren't wearing, and the senator from Illinois wasn't wearing, um, is, is pretty simple for HCV and, and HIV, but not for Ebola. So on one hand, people said, don't worry about it. It's nothing. This is a patient. Just take care of them like any other patient. And on the other extreme, there were people saying, everyone is going to get contaminated. Everybody 
in the hospital is going to die. Um, and so obviously the, the correct answer was somewhere in between. And after much discussion, we came up with what I thought were very impressive approaches that we also shared knowledge with other academic centers in the NIH that were dealing with the, the same issue. And it was impressive. We developed a cadre of technologists and nurses and physicians who would take care of those patients. A biocontainment intensive care unit was set up at the Allen Hospital, about 40 blocks north of here. Um, it was very impressive. People were trained. There was repeat training. It was wonderful. And then Ebola never came, except for our one ED doc who went and went, came back and went bowling and went out to dinner and stuff like that. Uh, but we never saw an Ebola patient here. And the training lasted for a while. Um, and then hospital administrators said, well, we have an empty ICU with no patients, and we need to put patients in there so we can make money and take care of people. And so the biocontainment ICU no longer exists. So what's going to happen today when a patient from the DR, uh, the Republic of Congo with a fever gets off an airplane at JFK and comes to our ED? I have no idea. We are not prepared. And so I appreciate and, and I, I understand uh, the global issues involved, and I appreciate the importance and certainly support that, but America's not prepared. Um, and uh, I think that's an issue. So, so. Thank you. Steve, thank you very much. Um, we're going to go extend a little bit past the noon time, but would like to, right this time, open up to any questions and get a discussion going. Yep. Hi, my name is Chris Tedeschi. I'm from emergency medicine. A good part of my job is figuring out what to do when that patient shows up from JFK. And I agree with you that we're generally not prepared for either the index patient or, more concerningly, the person under investigation, um, even though we are working to kind of bolster that. We've had very um, sort of intermittent cooperation and collaboration with a lot of our colleagues, both through NYP and Columbia. And as we continue to build this up, I love to sort of join forces with sort of everybody at the table um, and kind of continue to figure out those protocols, especially now that the BICU is gone. Um, I was taking a quick look when uh, Mr. Weber was speaking about our, on our hospital emergency drug list, and I noticed that it does not include fence of our um, Narcan. And uh, I guess I would ask, do you think we should stockpile Narcan along with doxycycline and Cipro? Yes. Absolutely, in, in, in large quantities. Um, because, you know, we're lucky we actually have a countermeasure but it has to be applied rapidly and uh, stockpiling. And then what, what we haven't figured out, and this is a fairly new thing to worry about. I mean, we worried about it at the Pentagon because we knew that countries like Russia were developing it for military use, potentially against us. But this is a new phenomenon where uh, bad actors can buy it in, you know, millions of lethal doses, quantities. So um, stockpiling, but then figuring out delivery on a mass scale is, is a huge challenge. Um, so I, I, I think we need smart people like you to begin to get their heads around it, because it, it's going to be a, a national and global uh, problem, whether we like it or not. Larry. Yeah. Echoing everybody else's comments, really wonderful talks. Um, it's probably for all three of you. The, the issue of biosurveillance, um, in another life I worked at the Galveston National Laboratory, and one of the things that was being discussed a decade ago, the notion of actually having surveillance systems available at airports, monitoring the air for detection of things like anthrax. I'm just curious in terms of giving cities, although I can only imagine what the panic will be like, although Ian Huxman knew things about panic, uh, so he could probably answer that question. Those types of surveillance systems, the ability, if they exist, to get the information out to emergency
Yeah, so um, one answer to your question is that there was a lot of um, investment and has been a lot of investment in, in this area, particularly at the Department of Homeland Security over the past decade. Um, programs like BioWatch, which were created to, to do this, um, have been widely criticized as not nimble enough, not flexible enough, not able to take advantage of the new technologies that you heard Ian uh, speak about and others earlier today speak about rapid diagnostic tests. I think that, uh, personally, I think that one of the things that we haven't done enough of in the U.S., and this is something that, that Andy tried to spearhead and did spearhead when he was at the Pentagon, is a, a real U.S. and, and by the way, also global um, effort to break down the different pieces of what we call real-time biosurveillance, which is really important. We all want to get there. But what are, the, what are the actual things we need to do to get there? And then where are the investments needed to get there? Which departments and agencies need the funding? Which academic centers need um, additional uh, workforce and funding? And then work at, collectively towards achieving it. Because we set up the National Biosurveillance Integration Center at DHS. We set up the BioWatch program. But in my view, we haven't really followed up those investments um, with a concerted effort to figure out how, how to make them nimble and flexible to take new technologies in and be able to actually um, detect in real time, push out the data in real time, share the data quickly, and, and connect, much less on a global scale. The last thing I'll say is there is interest, especially in civil society and out of foundations like Rockefeller here in New York, in thinking about how on a global scale biosurveillance could be broken down um, into some, some, um, some very specific catalytic projects of, that could be conducted on a global scale. And what I mean by that is many of you might be familiar with the Coalition for Epidemics Preparedness Innovation, CEPI, which has looked at countermeasures development and equitable distribution on a global scale in order to, to get at this issue of, of, um, of, of market, the market disincentives. Uh, that companies have for developing uh, drugs and vaccines for diseases that aren't likely to occur, but if they do occur, it could cause catastrophe. Taking that model and applying it to biosurveillance would be great. It's going to be really hard to do, but worth doing. Yeah, just put in a plug for environmental surveillance is, is very, a very important part of this. It needs to be integrated with clinical surveillance, um, but it makes me cry when I go into the metro in Washington and I see the same metal box collecting air samples that we were using uh, uh, 16 years ago. Uh, the technology has moved so fast forward. Uh, and it's key, especially for something like anthrax, which is not contagious, but that could be delivered in a large uh, you know, aerosol uh, cloud. To have that early detection uh, in metropolitan areas is, is so important. And when I look at how much we invest in nuclear detection in our cities, and especially here in New York, compared to how um, underinvested we are in, uh, in biodetection, it, it's, it's, uh, I, I can't explain it. And it's more likely. I mean, bio is much, much more likely than a nuclear um, explosive event. Uh, in the early 2000s, uh, Josh Letterberg and I sent in a, uh, a grant application of Sloan Foundation to characterize bacteria in the subways in Times Square, mm -hmm. where a million people go through, you know, twice daily. And uh, the New York City Department of Health um, said, we really don't want you to do this project because we don't know what we're going to do with the data. Um, and, and, you know, I was really very unhappy about this. Um, but in retrospect, I understand their viewpoint, because three or four years ago, um, scientists here in New York did some PCR analyses with high school students collecting materials from subways all over the city, and reported back that my stop at 103rd and Central Park West had Yersinia pestis and Bacillus anthracis. And the decision was made based on 200 nucleotide piece of DNA. And there are lots of bacillus that's not anthracis, and there are lots of other bugs that are not Yersinia pestis that may look like that. So some of these surveillance systems that we're talking about implementing 
are not ready for prime time. And until they are, we have to make certain that we don't create more chaos than, um, than help. Please. Hi, my name is Susan. Um, my question is, how do we, as an academic community, as a health community, help to push the agenda of um, developing standards, national standards, international standards for um, preparedness, uh, given what you said about the ICU being changed? And, and all of us thought we were caught off guard, but Ebola was a risk to the United States, and it's right now with the DRC. All it takes is one person coming from the DRC right now, and, and we could have the same situation. And, and I wonder how we, our response is specifically different than the news cycle or the politicians raising this as, as, um, as a panic. And, and we saw that with Ebola, and now, as you said, people are forgetting, they're getting comfortable. And that's probably when we're at most risk. Um, and the reaction in the early days of Ebola, I saw, because I was going back and forth a lot, was a, a real maturation of the response at the airport, which was really heartening to see. Um, and, and you could see that understanding, that response evolving, but now, we've let that go, and, and, and that makes me very concerned. And I think as a health community, come back to my question is, what is our role in keep, keeping a measured response but a persistent response um, to these threats? The, the, sh the short answer for me is I'm not sure. Um, uh, from 15 years working in, in this environment where the university does not own the hospital, they're completely separate institutions. I'm merely a consultant. In, in, on my best days, they consider me a consultant. On my worst days, they consider me something else. Um, <laughs> money is important, as you guys have described. And, and I understand, although I complain about hospital administrators a lot, I understand that they have a zero-sum game that they're playing every day of where they're going to, they put money here, there's not going to be money there. So I get that up to a point. And at least in my experience here, New York State is the most highly regulated state as far as laboratory testing goes, which I think is a wonderful thing. And really the only way, if I really need something and they don't want to do it, is I need a regulation or I need an inspection agency, New York State, the FDA, something like that to come in and tell us that we must do it and then it gets done. So the BICU, which by the way, they still have one at UCSF. It's empty, it's been empty for years, but it exists, I inspected it. Um, the only way we're gonna maintain a BICU here is if New York State or the federal government says we must, because then the zero sum game will go towards what we gotta spend money or otherwise they will close us down. Leadership is important, um, advocacy is important, but in my cynical point of view from, from doing this, only regulation requirements are going to make it happen and we're not we don't currently have a government that is enthusiastic about regulatory processes yeah susan i would say that the uh, panelists here are the experts on this but i'll venture to say one of the things we really need to do is to educate the decision makers because we saw with ebola in 2014 that many of the decisions were politically driven and after making good uh, sound public health decisions, they were overruled by political decision makers who wanted to show they were doing something. So I, I think there's a need for education at all levels, and I don't think we have successfully gotten uh, to that yet. Yeah, I'll, I'll only add um, two quick things. One is, is um, the continuation of, of some of the hospital preparedness work writ large, not just you know, when those centers were, were funded um, with Ebola emergency supplemental funding, there was a lot of discussion from my colleagues at the White House, um, who, one of whom was an emergency room physician. We were lucky to have him at the White House during the Ebola crisis. Um, and it, but one of the discussions that we had was how do we create 
a long-term approach to this problem, not just for Ebola, but for MERS, for the unknown virus that we're not expecting, to be able to be flexible, to adopt training, to have a, a workforce and centers that are thinking about what, what is coming down the pike that we're not thinking about. So I do think there are decision makers in Washington who are thinking about this. Um, and I think, um, you know, Columbia has a voice uh, with, the, with some of those experts, so I would consider that in the advocacy realm um, and, the, and translate that into the funding decisions that need to be made. The other thing I'd say is I encourage everyone, I have not in full disclosure done it yet, so I'm encouraging you to do something I haven't done yet myself. The, the United States has a national action plan for health security out of our own joint external evaluation. Um, it was posted online about a month and a half to two months ago. I'm sure that it includes elements related to hospital preparedness. I'd read it and think about where we, where we haven't improved and whether the grades that we got given um, and that we give ourselves are, are accurate in your point of view and get engaged. I, I would agree that the importance of education, and I'll give um, uh, one example. So Kathleen, um, you, you brought me back to my visit to Fukushima, and uh, uh, radiological dispersal devices, which um, are intended to spread radiation using sources like cobalt-60 or cesium-137, are actually not a big deal. Um, if they go off or attach to an explosive, they might kill people who, from the blast, and then 20, 30 years later, some people might get leukemia or you know, different kinds of cancer, but they're not a big deal. But because the public's not educated, if it were to happen in a, in a densely populated area, the panic and the anguish that would ensue would be unbelievable, and people wouldn't want to go back to that area because of the fear that radiation evokes. And that's a, an example where education could preempt that panic. Um, and then um, I think another role is, is uh, these are solvable problems, and pointing out that, that there's things we can do, real practical things we can do. Um, and it's not just, it's easy to, especially for policymakers to think, oh my God, it's just too hard, it's impossible, I don't want to deal with it. But helping, helping break it down and come up with practical, implementable, um, solutions is really key. Great. Are there any other questions? Yes. Oh, so there's there's two. They're related, and they're both on. The, you can find them by googling or uh, the H Google HHS, our Department of Health and Human Services, with National Action Plan for Health Security, NAPHS. But make sure you use US, or you'll get other countries will pop up. And the second is our own joint external evaluation. And those two are probably linked at the same uh, website um, under the, the USHHS mantra, which led it, but did not, by the way, it would, this is not just about HHS. It was a US government-wide effort. So before we thank everybody, I just want to ask for one other brief comment. It's probably the last time this morning we can make a quasi-political one. <laughs> Over the last few years, both in the areas of global health security and cooperation in new programs, and both in terms of bioterrorism, has there been a change in the role that America has played on these issues on a global scale? And what, have you, what is the effect of that has been? Yeah, I mean, the, at, the, at the top, there's a leadership vacuum. Um, America's role is greatly diminished around the world. Um, and that's too bad. I mean, one of the example, one of my um, takeaways from the Ebola, the, the last Ebola crisis, um, was the value of American leadership. Uh, you know, the world, we were all too late to respond to that. It, you know, now we know it started in December of 13. Uh, by serendipity, we launched the uh, Global Health Security Agenda in February of 14, before the first case at of Ebola had even been diagnosed uh, the next month in March. But um, it took American leadership to organize and mobilize that response. Seventy countries contributed to that response. And it took a little bit of hysteria, too, with the media attention on the imported cases into the U.S., which is unfortunate. I mean, is that, 
you know, we're watching the DRC at a slow boil. Is it going to take a, an imported case coming into your medical center to get that attention? But uh, President Obama led, and he mobilized, and he, you know, that that U.S. leadership capacity just isn't there uh, today, um, and that's that's really unfortunate. The good news is we have great people still in the government, the steady staters, <laughs> uh, the professionals who are working on these problems uh, every day. Yeah, I'll, I was going to make the I was going to make the, the the optimistic point at the end. I mean, Andy's Andy's right. Um, the United States does have a, a really good brand around the world with development programs, and our Centers for Disease Control is respected everywhere I've ever traveled uh, without, without question. And having those programs be strong and leading uh, on outbreak response is critical. I do think this though, on, on health security for a number of reasons, the new administration has embraced the policies of the Obama administration. You can debate whether they've adequately funded health security. You can debate lots of elements about their global health policies for sure. But on health security and the global health security agenda, they adopted it. And they adopted it so wholesale that the executive order that the Obama administration put in place in late, late 2016 was actually formally uh, codified within the new Trump national biodefense strategy. And so this, what I'm, I'm saying this not to, um, you know, give credit to one administration or the other, but to say that this is an area of unprecedented bipartisan agreement where two administrations that could not be more different have agreed on this one thing. And it's the thing we're all here to talk about. So what I think that gives us is this incredible moment to work on these preparedness challenges with a, you know, a Congress that also has leaders on both sides of the aisle. So the good news is there's actually a lot that we can do now on this topic um, where that may not be true across the board for other issues that we work on. That's great. Thank you very much. I want to take this opportunity to thank the panelists and discussants. Um, they deserve a round of applause. Um, thank you very much to everybody on that panel. That was really superb. First class, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I must say, just coming from this uh, panel, that um, I look forward to working with, um, with the NTI on two aspects of what has been raised. The first is to um, uh, scale up uh, biosecurity um, uh, prevention and detection in Africa, and we're developing a program to support the Africa CDC with that. And the second one is around this issue uh, involving creating norms and incentives for compliance when it comes to laboratory biosecurity issues. And so we'll be working on this and, in, and drawing in the experts from Colombia to be of assistance. Uh, if I can uh, just introduce um, Rita Sharon, um, who will be chairing this uh, session. She is a professor of clinical medicine and chair of the Department of Medical Humanities uh, at the College of Physicians and Surgeons. Uh, and uh, I thank you very much, Sharisa, for doing this. So. Thank you, Wilmot, and thank you, Wilmot for having made this day possible. Thank you also, Mark. Thank you also, Steve Nicholas, in his absence. <clears throat> We're a little behind time, so I will try to make things kind of um, pleated. Um, you notice how we came full around, back to Jennifer's conversation this morning, that we ended up <clears throat> talking about the individual healthcare workers who do this work. Steve Spitalnik, I remember, when we were preparing for that um, bioterrorism unit. I'm in the Division of General Medicine. Steve Shea, who was the um, practice director at the time, sent around a note to all the, the um, physicians and nurses asking for volunteers for this, this team, this advanced team. And I remember answering his note and saying, Steve, I volunteer, and that's because I was one of the oldest internists in the practice. So that's the kind of thinking 
I'm thinking of your oral histories, of your nurses. That is still the kind of thinking that goes on. And the next thing that comes to me to say is, especially listening to Professor Weber's uh, uh, comments, we keep remembering that having chosen lives in healthcare means that we keep learning things we wish we didn't know. Okay, so, um, and the brilliance of the design of this conference is that we're going to end on health. All right? We're, this panel is on the Children, Hospital, and Africa Mapping Project, which is health. Let me introduce very briefly the, three, the, two, uh, the two panelists and the discussant. Larry Stanberry, MD-PhD, is Professor of Pediatrics and now Dean for International Programs at Columbia University uh, Medical School. Um, he served as the Chair of Pediatrics for a decade? A decade. Uh, I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, he's an authority. He's, he's in the Pediatric Infectious Disease Division. He's an authority on viral diseases, antiviral drugs, and vaccines with extensive experience in preclinical and clinical development of drugs and vaccines. Um, he has served on more expert panels than one can count, uh, over 200 papers and nine books on these topics. Um, he, was in a, he, he served as an astonishing chair of pediatrics. Here is how. He was visionary, innovative, and modeled a moral responsibility toward the problems we were all trying to solve, and he became a convener, which is why he's here. He is a convener. Um, our, second, our second panelist is Dr. Philip LaRussa. He is also a professor of pediatrics at Columbia at the Medical Center in the Division of Pediatric ID. Uh, he's PI on Columbia's International Maternal Pediatric Adolescent AIDS Clinical Trials um, and supervises the on-site retrovirus study laboratory. He directs the CDC-funded Clinical Immunization Safety Assessment Center here at Columbia, studying immunogenicity, safety, and efficacy of uh, varicella vaccine in immunocompromised children and adults. And he, too, has been on the advisory panels of note in the US and globally uh, on questions of immunization, especially varicella and zoster. He's currently working on three federal grants studying vaccine safety and one private foundation grant to map children's hospitals in sub-Saharan Africa. And that's what we will hear about today. Our discussant um, is Jennifer Nuzo. She is senior scholar at Johns Hopkins University Center for Health Security. And she's associate director of Health Security, the, the uh, authoritative journal in the field. Um, she is on the faculty in the Department of Environmental Health and Engineering and in the Department of Epidemiology at Hopkins. She focuses her work on international and domestic biosurveillance, infectious disease diagnostics, and disease mitigation strategies. So we will have a discussion about health. Um, I ask Larry to come up. Thank you. Very good, thanks. Um, well, thank you, Rita. That was an absolutely lovely introduction. You're, you're, you're really way too kind. Um, so I, following on the theme is, is a comment that Susan had made about preparedness. Um, this talk really speaks to the issue of preparedness around a very special population. Um, you've seen this. Uh, Ian showed it. We know we've, we've got lots of bad things out there in the world, and we discussed some of them. Um, I'll just throw this slide up uh, because this is the 100th anniversary now of the worst uh, acute pandemic that we'd experienced uh, in the world. Um, and as Ian pointed out, uh, this was another example of a virus that emerged out of an animal population. 
uh, which is the theme that keeps repeating itself. I just jumped to this one um, because uh, a lot of what we're talking about today is based upon the world's response to the SARS outbreak back in 2002, 2003, and we'll talk about that a bit. Um, another uh, epizootic infection. Um, this is the WHO's current priority list, and, and you know many of these bad actors, uh, hemorrhagic fevers, Ebola, Marburg, Lassa, uh, the SARS and MERS viruses, Nipah, Hendra viruses, Rift Valley fever, which is always a chronic fear, uh, Zika, and then Disease X. Disease X is the one we don't know is coming. You probably can't really read this textbook. Uh, this is a textbook that Jim LaDuke and uh, uh, Dick Caslow and I uh, do. Uh, it's the fifth edition. It came out in 2014. Zika is not mentioned in this anywhere. Um, and neither is uh, Heartland virus, neither is Bourbon virus, neither are several other ones that we now are experiencing outbreaks here in the United States. So something will come along. It's only a question of when and, uh, and how bad is it going to be. So we know from everything that got discussed today that the global response to these pandemics, especially coming out of the, the SARS experience, was to modify the international health regulations back in 2005. And what um, changed with these regulations was a, um, the intent that the world be prepared to prevent, protect, against, and control um, and provide a public health response to international spread of disease. 196 states, which essentially all the nations of the world that are in the UN, um, signed on to this agreement. Everybody said, yes, we should be ready for the next pandemic. It's a really good idea. Uh, we want to make sure that human health is pr uh, protected. And by the same token, we recognize that these are unbelievably disruptive uh, events that have a huge financial impact on nations. So it wasn't entirely you know, uh, altruism that they were interested in. They were concerned about closing borders uh, uh, and people um, not, and produce and products not being able to be transferred uh, globally. So this comes along and this is great. Everybody signs on. And as, as, as both uh, Beth and Andy and others have implied, um, by 2014, even prior to that, people were looking at the world's response to the international health regulations 2005 and came to the conclusion nobody, everybody had signed the document, nobody had done anything. And so thanks to the Obama White House, and as, as uh, Andy and Beth implied, you know, really bright people uh, in the White House and in government saying we need to do something that, uh, that the global health security agenda was developed with a very specific goal of uh, helping nations be able to prevent, detect, and respond to, to uh, infectious disease threats. Um, and that was wonderful. There's all kinds of organizations that have signed on, many nations have signed on. As Beth showed you the map, um, we get the biggest uptake of the global health security agenda effort in Africa, which is one of the reasons that, as Phil will tell you in a little while, um, that some of the work we're doing is focused in Africa. But uh, along the way, in order to help nations be prepared, they developed the Joint External Evaluation Tool, which has really not been discussed extensively. Um, Beth mentioned that there are 19 categories on it. This is a tool that a nation uses to do a self-evaluation of their preparedness around 19 categories that are important in being able to prepare for and respond to a uh, public health emergency, especially an infectious disease one but not exclusively infectious disease. And, uh, and so this was an important uh, tool to be able to um, get nations prepared, at least assessed and, and thinking about what they need to do. So that's all great, that's wonderful. The world's really doing everything it should. We're getting all set, so what's the problem? Well, here's the problem. Um, neither the uh, WHO uh, International Health Regulations 2005, the Joint, uh, the Global uh, Health Security Agenda documentation, or the Joint External Evaluation, one time mentions children in the documents. Nowhere, not to be found. And I'll point out to you that of the almost eight billion people on the planet, um, 2.3 billion of them are children. So how can you kind of miss that size population? It seems a little bit inexplicable. Um, children are different. Anybody who thinks they're small adults uh, never had one of them. Um, 
and you, clearly you don't remember back to your own childhood, they're different in so many different ways. They're different anatomically, physiologically, immunologically, psychologically, developmentally, and metabolically. They are, for so many of these reasons, more vulnerable. Um, and it's worth pointing out for those people who are not interested in children, that children are marvelous little vectors. So you should be concerned about children. When you get influenza, you will be shedding virus 24 hours before you are symptomatic. When a child gets influenza, they shed a lot more virus two days before they become symptomatic. And in all likelihood, most of the infectious diseases that we're talking about, children are going to potentially be more contagious. And certainly it takes a lot more people to care for a child, so they put more people at risk when they're the ones who are infected. So keeping children safe and healthy is in everybody's best interest. Just a few examples. Children are often the ones who get sent to collect the water. The water is where the mosquitoes are often found. They're low to the ground. They're more likely to acquire vector-borne diseases. They're more susceptible to radiation. We, there's a lot of data uh, looking now at climate change and heat waves and the extent to which children are far more vulnerable to um, uh, death and injury as a consequence of, uh, of heat waves. Air pollution and uh, traumatic events, um, children who experience um, the traumatic events such as living in a um, refugee camp or um, storms like we've been experiencing globally um, are much more likely to go on and develop something the equivalent in pediatrics to post-traumatic post distress, uh, post distress syndrome uh, disorder um, with lifelong consequences in terms of their neuro, uh, neurodevelopmental trajectory. Um, children can't make their own decisions with regard to health care. They can't access it generally without the, uh, uh, an adult being available. Uh, there's very there's substantially less data available to pediatricians and people who provide care to children with regard to clinical decision making. We don't have the same number of, uh, of um, randomized clinical trials, for example, in uh, pediatrics that you do in adult medicine. Um, it requires, as I mentioned to you, far more people to care for a child. Children require different dosages, different formulations, different sizes of equipment. Um, different nutritional needs, a different management of fluids. So trying to extrapolate from adult data to decide what to do for a child is not a very good strategy. We need meaningful child-specific data, not, uh, not hand-me-down data from adults that doesn't fit. Um, I love this picture. Uh, if you can imagine trying to get drugs into a baby when all the drugs are either in a pill or a capsule form, a child under the age of a, somewhere between six and eight cannot swallow a pill. And generally, just crushing up the pill isn't going to give you the same pharmacodynamics. Um, children, because they are metabolically different, their pharmacokinetics are different. Their absorption, distribution, and excretion patterns are different. So we can't extrapolate from adult data on pharmacokinetics to decide what to do for a child. Um, and then certainly in the case of diagnostic tests, and this is one I always bring up with, uh, uh, with Ian, um, there are situations in which uh, children's performance on diagnostic tests are not the same as they are in adults. So diagnostic tests need to be designed with children in mind, including the use of incredibly small amounts of blood. Mm -hmm. Because when somebody tells you you need 10 cc's of blood in order to run a test, that might be and a small infant, a large proportion of their blood volume. So um, coming back to this point about the fact that they've been neglected, we really need to do more to address what are the needs of children. And so um, one of the things we just wanted to point out were some of the things that we think make sense with regard to uh, beginning to address the needs of children in terms of pandemic preparedness. We need. Um, interdisciplinary, multinational platforms to advocate for children and their unique needs. I don't know why we have to keep reminding adult policymakers um, that there are um, a large proportion of every country's population that have special needs and that we're not, we're not thinking about them as we start doing these kinds of plannings. We need a mechanism to begin to incorporate child-specific specific, specific um, 
questions uh, in things like the health regulations, the JEE, and, and the, certainly the agenda of the Global Health Security uh, Program. Um, there's n a lot more research needed. You, you, what do you say when you're an academic? There's always a need for more research. But I think in this particular case, we, we were looking at what was going on, and a friend of mine, one of my friends, was involved in the development of ZMAP, uh, the plant body that was being used uh, for treatment of Ebola. There's no data on what the pharmacokinetics of that compound looks like in children, even though it was used experimentally. They just made up the dose. So um, in the absence of meaningful data, one has the potential of developing strategies that you think are just based on expert advice, the best approach that we can have. And so we don't even have that with regard to, uh, to pediatrics and pandemics. The other thing um, is the development, as I mentioned, of protocols and policies. One of the things that we don't know what to do in this nation is what happens if a child comes in um, and doesn't have a parent? Who consents for them to get health care? Um, and one of the things that probably should fit large in this is what are we going to do when the parents are all dead and we've got orphans? We have some experience with that as a consequence of the AIDS epidemic, but that was a slowly evolving event. That wasn't a catastrophe. So what are we going to do to prepare for caring for children in a setting when there are no parents or guardians? We need to make sure that we've got medical and surgical equipment that works uh, for children. And coming back to the medical countermeasures that are being developed, and when I was at the Galveston National Lab, this was one of our major focuses, trying to develop new countermeasures. It's important that they be developed in a, f in a formulation uh, that allows them to be used in children. Uh, and then again, making sure the diagnostic tests work and ideally, <clears throat> preferably, don't even use blood, but rather saliva or urine. <clears throat> and coming back to the first talks around, uh, around Jennifer Dorns, for example, we do need to start thinking about workforce development, in this case around nurses, uh, around uh, community health workers, and certainly around physicians who have specific training. When you start looking around the world, uh, most countries have a remarkably small number of pediatricians, and, uh, and Phil will, I suspect, say a little bit about the project that we're working on now to try to get some sense of the extent to which there are providers, who, uh, nurses and doctors, uh, who actually have any pediatric experience. Um, so I'm just going to end with this uh, quote from Nelson Mandela. Um, there is no keener revelation of a society sold in the way it treats its children. So thank you. Well, I get the last lecture of the day, so I'll try to get you out of here relatively quickly. I just want to say one correction. Uh, we no longer have a pediatric AIDS clinical trials unit here at Columbia. And I have to say it one, was one of the proudest days of my life when we sat down to write the next grant. And we, we really did not have enough perinatally acquired disease to justify it. And we were very happy to be put out of business there. I, I will say that one of the things that taught me, and in the rare stroke of brilliance by the NIH, they partnered sites in the United States that had long-standing units with uh, new sites when they started funding international units. And we were paired uh, with the, the pediatric unit in Durban, South Africa. And those collaborations uh, really sort of helped me formulate how I think about people handle epidemics like HIV and others. And those collaborations have uh, continued to today. And I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, how that's affected uh, my thinking on this. OK, let's see if, how this works. I'm going to need some help here. Oh. Top one. OK. So Larry's given you the background about this, and I'm not going to go through this in any detail. Uh, what I will say is, you know, you should read the Joint External Evaluation Tool. And remember that it's really a tool for countries to do a self-assessment 
of how they would hand, handle a global health emergency. And I really can't think on that level. That's something that Larry and Wilmot do better than I do. And I'm really more interested in what happens on an institutional level. And one of the things that the three of us thought about was, well, could we modify that tool in a way that institutions that cared for children, and I'll talk a little bit about that, uh, could we could modify that tool to make something that an institution could use to assess their own ability to care for children during emergencies. And we had two purposes, well actually three purposes. One was to actually have the self-assessment tool for the institution. Two, two was to think about what sort of events uh, we needed to think about, but not only in the um, um, the idea of an emergency. You know, look what happened to our biocontainment unit at the Allen. That's gone now. So one of the things we thought is that if you could get a group together that would agree on how to do the task at hand, which was the emergency situation, maybe you could keep that group together and work on everyday problems like antimicrobial resistance and things like that. And then the third thing which actually came out of the meeting that I'll tell you about in a minute was this group really wanted to stay together to work on problems that they thought were important. So uh, when, you know, when the idea came about about uh, making this self-assessment tool, I thought, well, it probably has already been done. I'll just look in the literature. And what I found was a 2009 report from the Gates Foundation, which was essentially a list of institutions in different countries uh, that pro provided care for children, no detail. So what we thought is we would look at this, uh, we understand, we say children's hospital mapping project, but we understand that most children in Africa are cared for outside of freestanding children's hospitals. So we have a very broad definition. It's, you know, institutions that care for large numbers of children, but we did want to look at the freestanding children's hospitals that do exist because they would help provide a focus and a way forward to see what was going on everywhere else. So we got some money from um, uh, the president, Columbia University presidents, Global Innovation Fund uh, to hold a meeting in Nairobi. And essentially, the purpose of the meeting was to get together pediatric leaders from around Africa to help us think about whether we could actually modify the joint external evaluation tool, what things we should look at, what institutions we should look at, and so on and so forth. And uh, one of the great things about this small amount of money was we got the opportunity to work with the Global Innovation, the Global Center in Nairobi. And those of you who have not worked with Columbia University's Global Centers really should look into it, because I think probably we could not have successfully carried this out if it weren't for them. They really helped us think about the issue. They uh, did all the logistic things. They were very thoughtful about who we should in invite and things like that. And so we got these people together, and you, you're not meant to read this. What you can see is that there's representation from around Africa, and these were all pediatric leaders, and we basically gave them a charge. Take a look at the issues uh, the uh, 19 indicators, see what you thought about that, and see if we could turn this into some sort of evaluation tool for institutions. And a little of this was laziness on my part, but you know, uh, the way I like to do this is we divided them into three regional groups, sent them off into uh, breakout rooms to discuss the issues we gave them, and then had them come back and report to the entire group on what they found. And they really sort of developed the ideas around how we were gonna do this. So uh, since that meeting, uh, we've been working on turning those ideas into uh, an evaluation, a survey that actually could work. And Hannah uh, Glade Bender, who talked uh, before, um, was very helpful in putting it together 
into REDCap in a way that institutions could use it as a self-assessment tool. It's about 33 pages in length, and one of the things we're going to look at, I'll show you some topics in a minute, one of the things we're going to look at is how wieldy or unwieldy it is. So this was our idea. Help us select in, uh, the institutions to be evaluated, and I'll show you that in a minute. We had planned on conducting uh, surveys of 24 institutions. We naively believed that we could do six hospitals over a three-week period, and we were going to do four of these trips for a total of 24 hospitals. That probably is not going to work, and we're working on that now. Uh, the site gets the evaluation tool about a month before we get go there. They do a self-assessment. We'll have a three-day or two-and-a-half-day meeting where we discuss the findings of their report, figure out what the next steps are, and uh, um, take a look at the facility to see um, uh, what the operating rooms are like, what the laboratory room, uh, labor laboratories are like, so on and so forth. The institution then prepares a report outlining the next steps and what they see as areas of strengths and deficiencies, and then prepares the final report. Uh, I should say that this part of the um, project was funded by grants from the Elma Foundation and from Charles Hamilton, and we're very grateful to both of those. So these are just some of the questions uh, that are in there, and I, I, I wanted to fit everything on one slide and not go through the entire 33-page uh, survey. We basically wanted to get an idea of what the facility was like, you know, um, uh, how is it funded, where, did it, uh, where is it in the hierarchy of health care, are they affiliated with the medical school, uh, do they take patients from other institutions? Do they have to refer patients to other institutions for kind of care? What's the age range of children that they take care of? Do they take care of infants? Do they take care of children? What's the age that they stop at? Do they have pediatric ICU beds? What's in the ICU? Are there ventilators? What are their capabilities as far as surgery, anesthesia, malnutrition, and things like that? And we also then wanted to also look at staffing. So what, what's um, uh, the physician's training? What are the nurse's training? What are the laboratory training in terms of uh, general uh, abilities, specialty care for children? all the way down the line so we could get an idea of what sort of resources could either be shared or looked for. And finally, how are services paid for? Uh, do patients have to pay for their own care or uh, is it partially funded by the government? So I'll quickly tell you this is, our, uh, this is sort of the schedule of our evaluations. Uh, next week, we start on the trip. Uh, we're going to Zambia, South Africa, and Zimbabwe. The second, and I've listed the hospitals there. In January, we're going uh, back to South Africa, to Zimbabwe, Lesotho, and probably one other, one other institution. And finally, we're going to hit on the other 17 hospitals or so in a relatively short period of time after that. Don't ask me how we're going to do that. So um, in, in the idea of evaluation and self-evaluation, uh, and this is going to be an ongoing thing, one of the things we want to look at is, is this really a worthwhile exercise? Uh, is, does the evaluation accurately reflect what's going on in the institution? Uh, and if so, um, does it ad identify areas of needs and strengths that could be shared in different ways? Uh, should we look at additional institutions? Do we go back to an institution a second time to see how things have uh, progressed? We're probably going to have another meeting in Nairobi at some point to get everybody back together and say, here's what we found, what do you think? Should we continue doing this? Should we do something different? And eventually what I hope is two things. One is that this will get, in some form or another, will get incorporated into either um, WHO, uh, UNICEF, and national programs. Uh, but also that 
we were able to use this, and I say we collectively as a group, to identify resources to improve the services that are provided to children uh, in these areas because there's not much sense in identifying needs if you're not going to do anything about it. So these are the people uh, that are involved, Dr. Stanberry, Wilma James, myself, and Hannah Grace Bender. Uh, and um, I'll stop there. Thank you. Easier. Um, so thank you for that. I have two young kids, including one in daycare, so I am full aware of the whole children as vectors phenomenon, <laughs> and um, I'm grateful, deeply grateful to the pediatricians in our lives, um, because we wouldn't be able to put one foot in front of the other without them. So um, anyway, thank you for that. And um, since this is the end of the day, I thought I'd just reflect a little bit on what we heard today. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I think. Throughout the course of the day, we talked about kind of a broad range of health security threats. We talked a lot about Ebola in West Africa, and certainly that conversation is still unfortunately very relevant given um, the ongoing crisis in DRC, which is just a few cases away from being the second biggest Ebola outbreak in history. Um, really, really devastating situation. Um, but we also talked a lot about emerging infections, and I think there are a lot of parallels there and a lot of things that um, we continue to learn from those events. Uh, we talked also about deliberate um, events, biological um, weapons, bioterrorism, um, inadvertent events from laboratory mishaps and um, misuse of biology, um, despite the enormous powers that, um, for good that it uh, possesses. And then um, we also talked about radiologic events. We talked about Fukushima and a number of different things. Um, Andy even alerted us to um, parallels with the opioid crisis that the public health community is, um, is struggling with. And I think what this illustrates, if you just kind of took that list, it would seem like this wide-ranging conversation, but it makes sense in a lot of ways because when we're talking about health security, we're focusing on, you know, we're saying threat agnostic. We're focusing on what are the capacities that we need to have in place for the next threat period, the next crisis. We don't know what it's going to be. It could be something we're dealing with Ebola now. We thought you know, we had learned a lot of the lessons there, but we're still um, uh, continuing to learn lessons with respect to Ebola. But Zika, I mean, how many of us were surprised by the challenges that that posed? So I think the overarching lesson in health security is we have no idea what the threats are going to be tomorrow, maybe old, maybe new, maybe something that we never dreamed of. But if we focus on having a broad set of capacities that are in place, that are built, exercised, trained, maintained, key there being maintained, um, we talked about sustainable development, and that's key to that, um, then we should be better off when the next thing um, comes up. We talked a lot about you know, the GHSA and the JEE, so mechanisms for measuring and monitoring and motivating um, investments and commitments to strengthening global health security capacities. And I think those are really important tools and tools that we didn't have. I mean, I just uh, some of us who were at the GHSA ministerial meeting um, that was just took place a couple weeks ago in, in Bali, I mean, just seeing the collection of countries sitting there and having honest difficult, um, committed conversations about how to improve um, basic public health capacities. I mean, it, it's easy for us to focus on where the gaps are, but to just take a step back and think about that conversation 10 years ago is, is almost inconceivable, that we could have countries sitting around the table saying, how do we improve our surveillance? As a, high, as a matter of high political um, priority, how do we improve our surveillance? Anyway, I just want to just acknowledge the progress. However, we know that there are gaps, right? And so um, we talked about a number of them today, and I think I just wanted to show, I wasn't going to show slides, but the conversation this morning was so stimulating that I, I just wanted to, how do I do the screen? Okay. Um, 
we talked a lot about health systems and health workers and the workforce. And I think this is a real area where we as a medical and public health community um, need to really lean in here because this is, I think, a critical piece of the health security conversation, but a piece that's largely missing. Um, we have, are doing some work, and it's very, um, I think there's a lot of synergies with the work that you are all doing here on the um, projects we just heard about. Um, but looking at the JEE, you know, our primary tool for assessing how ready countries are for threats like Ebola. Now, is it an important tool and a tool that we should focus on and a tool that we should continue to throw our weight behind and support? But I think we're doing a disservice to countries by saying that if you meet all of those criteria, you develop all those capacities, you're ready. Because as we have seen, um, there are critical components missing, particularly when we talk about healthcare environments. Um, we are doing a project, and I'll explain it in a minute, but one of the things that we've been doing is um, talking to folks who've been working in the field of health system strengthening, so people who are experts in those fields. Talk to people from all over the countries, including people who are on the front lines of some of the events that we talked about. I can't tell you how many of them have never heard of the JE. So we have to kind of bridge disciplines here, and we talked a lot about territoriality and silos and things. I mean, we have to really kind of all kind of all in together on this and um, look at this. So when we have done a crosswalk, similar to what you did looking at um, pediatric capabilities, just looking at, if you think about what happens at that first point where that patient walks into a health clinic or is, or is encountered by a, a community health worker, what happens then? What are the capacities that need to be in place in those environments so that we are able to respond? And then we look across the whole JEE and we find that there are a couple places where if we are being generous, we could say, yeah, if countries were really committed, they could kind of mention health workers and <laughs> healthcare environments in those sections um, and, and, and have it be addressed. But for the large number of the things that we've identified, and we looked across the literature, we've talked to, you know, as I said, a number of experts, it's just not in the tool. It's not, and, and that makes sense, that's not really what the tool was developed for. But why this is important, we heard a number of, um, great compelling examples this morning about why health um, environments are, um, you know, the risks that are posed to the workers, they're the front lines of the front lines of this fight. Um, but also when we think about the public health capacities that country, we're asking countries to develop, things like real-time surveillance, right, important goal. You can't have real-time surveillance unless you have a national laboratory system. Two things that are addressed quite thoroughly by the JEs, right? But what, under, what, what supports both of those things? Somebody who has an encounter with a health worker who thinks, hmm, something's not right and thinks about ordering a specimen that gets sent to that laboratory. So anyway, I'm not gonna belabor a point, you all know this, but just to say um, it's something that we wanna work to. And it's an open invitation to um, continue to work together on this. I'm running a project right now that we're doing, um, thanks to funding from the Rockefeller Foundation to develop a health systems resilience checklist and implementation guide. Uh, we're working with the World Bank and um, partners with our with um, ICDDRB and, and DACA, Bangladesh. Um, trying to identify what are the capacities that health systems need and really giving an emphasis to both what's in the um, purview or control of ministries and what's in the um, control of facilities and thinking about trying to put some specificity there because for the most part when we talk about health systems resilience, and we, it's been at the very high level attribute level. Um, we're also, one of my colleagues um, Dave, at Hopkins, David Bashai, he's actually a pediatrician by training turned economist is working on developing also an implementation guide because we know that a checklist and assessment tool is just the start, not the end. And so trying to create a process for um, moving from assessment to um, improvements. So thank you.
reality that we have is that the largest growing segment of the pop global population are older adults. Mm -hmm. And so we have that special interest group. And then if we have the special interest group of pediatrics and the special interest group here, we sort of, everyone's got the same concern about lifespan and developmental approach, but we run the risk of losing the synergies that might happen if we could take a full life course approach rather than we need to focus on kids. So I just wonder what you think about that. Um, you know, I, I certainly as an adult don't want to exclude being prepared as an adult to, to address the issue. I think the problem I have, and it kind of comes back to being a pediatrician, the American Academy of Pediatrics is probably the only professional organization that was created to advocate for its patient population, not its professionals. And so as a consequence, it's part of my core to say my job is to make sure children are not neglected. The fact that this just keeps coming up, like my complaints about not being prepared for the next, um, uh, next major storm somewhere, is, is the fact that we, we don't seem to learn lessons. And so unless there's somebody loudly advocating for this population, which by the way, isn't particularly a small segment of the population, I mean, it reflects a about a quarter of the world, and in some countries it represents more than 50% of the population. So I, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be concerned about the elderly and so on. It's just, that for me personally, I, I just need to stay focused on this population. So maybe Phil's got a more... No, I actually have a more uh, technical approach to the, to the issue. I don't have any problems with the lifespan approach, but I think um, there are so many uh, pediatric specific issues like dosing of drugs is different in zero to seven days of life as opposed to seven to 20 uh, to 28 days of life as opposed to the first month of life as opposed to five years of life so the road you know the kind of equipment you have you know I'm old enough that I took care of children with adult respirators and knew exactly the problems that you were going to have when you did that. And um, so I, I understand what you're saying, but I think, uh, you know, like Larry said, we're pediatricians and we want to make sure that at least the interventional issues are addressed in a reasonable way. Uh, just one other comment. Um, after 9-11, I spent a decent amount of time on uh, New York City Department of Health committees that, whose names I can no longer remember. And there were issues that we never really um, addressed in a reasonable way, like the idea if something happened at midday and the kids were at school, the people in the school would want to go want to have to go home to their own families, who is going to care for the kids, who is going to make sure that whatever intervention 
took place, who had the authority to say that the intervention was warranted. And I understand there are issues for different age groups. It's just that I think my experiences, those were never handled after. And, and the way we handled it is we just stopped meeting after a while. <laughs> bioethics program here at Columbia, and I'm currently in a research ethics course, so the issues of patient autonomy and justice are running through my head. Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering what suggestions you have for the research that you, you want done um, so that these kids can have the correct treatment during pandemics. What, what do you see is the best route to do the, this research? Well, I I'll start and then, and then Phil or Jennifer may have other comments. Um, the, the United States did something interesting if, just a couple of years ago in that they um, passed a law that requires that all drugs now be tested in children. The vast majority of drugs that we have, probably 85, 90 percent of the drugs we prescribe for children actually have no pediatric indication and no specific data about dosing. Um, so we're all doing so-called off-license use of the drugs. So we now have a mechanism by which uh, drugs can be tested in children, both for mostly around pharmacokinetics and not so much around efficacy because that's always trickier. Um, but we would be really delighted just to have data on pharmacokinetics around any medical countermeasures. So there are, there are actually uh, strategies that have been vetted by bioethics groups and by institutional review committees that give us a, a mechanism by which we can evaluate new drugs and vaccines. Um, uh, two comments. You know, some of these issues, and I'll say one thing about the drugs and then about the ethical issues. Some of the, um, the pharmacokinetic issues are tough. I mean, how long have we had efavirenz as one of the most effective anti-HIV drugs? We don't, still don't have really an effective liquid formulation. That may be a problem that's just too tough for us to crack right now. As far as the ethical issues of who has the authority uh, to um, uh, say that children should be treated, it's, it's obviously going to be different in every country. Uh, and I know in New York State what's necessary is for the Commissioner of Health to declare a public health emergency. And then the Commissioner has the authority to say this is what we're going to do and uh, these are the protocols we're going to use. Uh, but a lot of that was not clear until it actually happened. And people said, well, what do we do about this population? What do we do about orphans? What do we do about kids in institutions? So um, those are issues that I would like to think about before the next thing happens. I just wanted to add one quick thing and just to kind of broaden the, the focus a little bit because you're interested in these issues. I think when we often talk about the ethics of um, particularly medical countermeasures in kids, we focus on is it ethical to test in kids and, and, and trying to set up those, those tests and thinking through those. But we don't often consider the ethics of the ethical dilemma of not doing the tests and so that we're resorting to these off-license sort of uses. I, I know this has come up um, with respect to the Zika crisis and particularly people looking at the lack of clinical trials aimed at pregnant women and the, the emphasis on developing medical countermeasures that potentially wouldn't be a good fit for pregnant women despite the fact that they were um, potentially at greatest risk of complications from Zika infection. So um, I think there is a rising recognition that we have to consider ethics of testing as well as of non-testing, so. Yeah, another great example of that was the, um, uh, the Ebola vaccine trials in West Africa where, uh, because one of the things I do is vaccine safety, the CDC asked us to comment on um, some of their trial designs. And one of the things we brought up is pregnant women are at the highest risk of mortality of Ebola. And we could not convince them to include pregnant women in the testing. Nothing, finally they just said, you said your piece, it went all the way up and down the chain, forget it, it's not gonna happen. So they essentially put 
uh, healthcare workers and women in the position of lying to get something that was potentially life-saving. You're on our list. <laughs> and, and, and I think uh, one of the things, you know, I gave you a very short list of what we were going to look at. One of the things we wanted to see is not only are there people, pediatricians with uh, specific pediatric training, but are there generalists who have training in caring for children? And, you know, that's one of the things where you could say, well, what you have competent people here, mm -hmm. what you need are protocols for people to know what dose is. I mean, we do that with HIV, right? We have dose-based dosing that works very well. So it's, it's a fixable problem, I think. So the, the thing is about these, uh, they are trained pediatricians, but they end up staying in the, in the big cities. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, they are pediatricians in the big cities, but in those little uh, villages, they don't really have pediatricians. So you end up treating the mother and the, the whole family, and they are being treated. We've seen cases where actually a liver failure in the, in the child because they give you my so, so, and there are probably potentially a lot of different solutions to that, uh, and it will depend on the nation as to what would work well. We heard a talk last night by Lynn Friedman, Freeman, um, over at Public Health, is it Lynn Friedman, who does um, averting maternal mortality, and they've got a program where they train surgical technicians to do emergency C-sections in, in uh, Mozambique, for example. And, uh, but the, the other one I was going to say is that we, the place where the biological high containment ICU was at the Allen Hospital is, as was said, about 40, 50 blocks north of the main campus here. Um, we do not staff that hospital emergency room with pediatric emergency doctors. Instead, we've got a telemedicine connection so that if a child comes in and the regular emergency medicine doctors are uncomfortable, they can get an instant consult with a pedi pediatric specialist as to how to provide care. And we heard a little bit about M Health earlier from, from Yanis. The notion of being able to have a general practitioner, a nurse, anybody link up anywhere in the world with somebody who's got specific knowledge, theoretically that kind of a system can be developed. I just want to say one thing just to, to put your context in. In a, in a very current context, um, about a last week, WHO was um, reflecting on new cases of Ebola and DRC, in particular a high number of um, pediatric cases of Ebola, which hadn't been seen in, um, in West Africa to their, um, and, and, and they think in part that some of these cases are occurring at um, sort of a, they call tradi um, modern health clinics, where it's a mix of traditional and modern um, clinics. People bring their kids there. They're getting malaria treatments and um, uns in an unsafe fashion and getting exposed to Ebola in the process. So it's now becoming an important driver of overall community transmission. Sorry. <laughs>
not unusual in the university and the president of Columbia the Biology spoke about the university's for purpose, which is to have consequence in the real world. And all three of these projects are designed in that way. The first one, the epidemics and nurses, is about influencing our very key policy. Uh, and also what happens in terms of training tradition in the national school as, uh, as a best practice example. The second one, dealing with biosecurity, is to uh, upscale biosecurity protection uh, uh, across the globe, but specifically in the interface of what was presented here, focusing on Africa. And the third one, uh, which is to uh, take the WHO JEE. Nineteen technical areas, and five in the case of children, and assessing what happens in the PDF services in Africa, where there are five pre-standard children on the floor and constantly. We actually don't know what's happening elsewhere. So you can see what the fruits of the, of the global health security that the gentleman has been. We've uh, back to the second generation project that actually looks at um, using the resources provided by the PHSA. Uh, to in fact uh, have some real world consequences. So this is what it means to collaborate and what the power of collaboration really is. Uh, it's, uh, at a university it's difficult to get right, but once you get it right, you actually need to fly. And I think we, without being trying to self I think that we are capable of achieving many things, cooperate uh, and, uh, and not uh, uh, divide the world. <laughs> so I think that, um, so I go away closing to thank everybody for coming, to thank Beth and, uh, and Andy and Jennifer for coming to the town, they really appreciate it. Uh, there will be outcomes uh, out of this meeting that are very concrete, other than in addition to raising awareness by using the form that we just uh, take all day and then it clips. But we are going to consolidate the group that we started have an organized program of events that uh, involves having kind of each day on a regular basis, uh, not only at Columbia University, but also with like-minded institutions, uh, like uh, Josh Hopkins, for example. So thank you very much again uh, for giving up your time.